Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. As a designated federal officer for the Global Markets Advisory Committee, it is my pleasure to call this meeting to order. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's meeting. This is the fourth meeting under the sponsorship of Commissioner Stump and the second and final of 2020. In light of the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are holding today's meeting as a virtual meeting to protect the safety of agency personnel, GMAC members, guest pan panelists, and the public. To ensure that today's meeting goes as smoothly as possible, there are a few logistical items that I need to mention. Because this is a virtual meeting, it is also being broadcast in a live stream on the internet. So please be sure to identify yourself before speaking. Also, please signal when you have completed your comments so that we can continue with the next speaker or question. Please ensure that your phone is unmuted before you start to speak, that you speak clearly into your phone, and that you remute your line when you are done speaking. For GMAC members and commissioners, if you would like to be recognized during the discussion, please use the WebEx chat icon on the bottom of the screen, select the All Panelists option within the drop-down menu, indicate that you have a, a comment or a question, and press Enter. If any meeting participant needs assistance during the call, please dial star zero to connect to the conference operator or message me directly within the WebEx chat. Finally, please keep your telephone line muted when you are not speaking. If you do not mute your line, the conference operator may need to mute it for you. I'd now like to turn things over to the GMAC sponsor, Commissioner Dawn Stump, for her opening remarks. Good morning and welcome to the final Global Markets Advisory Committee meeting of the year. Uh, this is Dawn Stump, and I would like to begin by thanking Chairman Tarbert and my fellow commissioners for attending today's meeting. I also want to recognize that due to the global nature of this committee, there are many members and panelists participating in local time zones that may be less than convenient, and I'm extremely grateful for their willingness to do so. I would especially like to thank all of today's esteemed presenters for being here and for taking the time out of your busy schedules, and in the case of Takashi, for joining us during your overnight hours to contribute to today's important discussion. Additionally, I would like to thank Chair Angie Karna for her leadership of the GMAC and Andre Goldsmith, the GMAC designated federal officer for organizing today's meeting. As the year comes to a close, I also want to take the opportunity to recognize the specific contributions of this committee to the CSTC's work. During your last meeting, we focused on the need to better align our global regulatory expectations for margin requirements on transactions not subject to central clearing. Since then, the Commission has acted on a number of the related recommendations received from this committee and continues to consider other elements of the report you submitted from your subcommittee on margin requirements for non-cleared non swaps. This is but one indication of how important your work is here to informing the Commission, and for that, we are grateful. To all of those who serve on each of the CSTC's advisory committees and subcommittees, I just wish to say thank you. Having devoted the last GMAC meeting to properly calibrating the regulations of non-centrally cleared derivatives, today we will shift our focus to advancing clearing in the global derivatives market. The first panel will focus on regulatory developments affecting the global clearing system. August Einholz and Abigail Knopf from the CFTC's Division of Clearing and Risk will present on the CFTC's recent rulemaking concerning registration with alternative compliance for non-U.S. derivatives clearing organizations. Then Patrick Pearson, Head of Financial Market Infrastructure at the European Commission, will discuss the finalization of a mere 2.2 and in particular, the regulations framework for supervision of third country CCPs. And Takashi Nagoka, Deputy Commissioner for International Affairs at the Financial Services Agency of Japan, will discuss Japan's interest in the CFTC providing an exemption for CCPs to be able to offer clearing services to U.S. clients. These three presentations will together highlight the importance of mutual recognition of comparable comprehensive regulatory framework for supervising central counterparties around the world. We will reflect on the progress we have made to date and what more can be done to advance the shared goals of increasing central clearing for derivatives. During our second panel, four presenters will look back at global derivatives clearing over the course of 2020, with a particular focus on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
First, Nick Rustad, Chairman of the Board of Directors of FIA, will present a clearing member's perspective on CCP margin requirements during the market volatility caused by the pandemic. We will then hear from representatives of two CCPs on their respective experiences during the pandemic. Sean Downey, Executive Director, Clearing Risk and Capital Policy at CME Group, and Dimitri Sinko, Chief Risk Officer at Eurex Clearing. To wrap things up, Sayi Saranavasan, Director, sorry, Deputy Director in the Division of Clearing and Risk at the CFTC, will present a regulator's perspective on CCP margin practices during the recent market volatility. I'm hopeful that these presentations will contribute to the ongoing dialogue regarding lessons learned from the market volatility earlier this year so that global clearing systems can remain resilient in the face of future market stresses. I'm very much looking forward to today's presentation. And again, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here to further these important conversations pertaining to global de derivatives clearing. That concludes my opening remarks, so I'll turn it back to Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stump, Chairman Tarbert. Thank you, Andre, and I am very pleased to be here today to address this group. Uh, this may be, I think, my last GMAC meeting, at least as chairman, um, so it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. Over the last 17 months, the CFTC has set and met some very ambitious goals, and we did all of that while managing the fallout of COVID-19, which has changed the way all of us work and collaborate. Many of our achievements, and this is the point of my remarks today, have actually been built on the great work of GMAC, as well as Commissioner Stump's leadership. So I want to sincerely thank you, Commissioner Stump, for your vision and commitment. You have made the GMAC an important part of our success. In fact, as Commissioner Stump mentioned, you know, several of our policymaking successes in the last 12 months alone have drawn on the ideas that are discussed right here at the GMAC. So, for example, uh, GMAC has taken up, uh, and we'll talk about today, uh, some important international issues, uh, including the implement implementation of EMIR 2.2. And, of course, I'm pleased to say that we have made great progress on that issue, um, and we've greatly benefited from uh, this committee's insight uh, in insights in, in doing that. And I can honestly say that I think our relationship with Europe uh, and other countries around the world is stronger today than it's ever been. We've been able to reach what I think is a truly win-win uh, resolution. Uh, GMAC has also advanced our thinking on the issue of exemptions from registrations for DCOs or clearinghouses, uh, which we actually turned into a final rule last month. And I'm confident that this committee will continue to be an important voice on that topic, as well as on related matters of equivalence and substituted compliance. And then finally, as Commissioner Stump mentioned, we've benefited greatly from GMAC's insight into the implementation and phasing of the uncleared margin rules. Uh, your recommendations on the scoping and implementation, the subcommittee report, were especially helpful uh, not only in generating ideas, but actually allowing us to translate those ideas into final rules. So like those before it, today's meeting is sure to advance more important ideas, particularly involving CCPs, clearing, and related issues affecting our global markets. And again, I just want to thank everyone on the GMAC for your service, um, for providing that. It's critically important for a financial regulatory agency such as us to be able to listen and really glean insights from all of our key diverse stakeholders. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Tarbert. Commissioner Quinten. Uh, thank you, Andre, and thank you for uh, your uh, leadership from the staff perspective of GMAC. And of course, a uh, thank you to Commissioner Stump. Um, the agendas of these meetings have been uh, profound, very well put together, and as Chairman Tarbert said, had a direct and positive impact on our policy making. It's one thing to hold a meeting and to discuss various issues. It's another thing to organize them over a long-term perspective uh, on topics of critical importance to the agency and the markets and have those discussions actually inform 
what we do as a commission. And I just really like to thank her for her leadership and vision uh, there. Uh, with regards to today's agenda, I'm very much looking forward to hearing all of the presentations. These are issues that are um, close to my heart. I know they're very, very close to Commissioner Stump's heart as well as the rest of uh, our commissioners and our chairman um, and highlighting the what I think is um, very positive progress that has been made on the issues of, of deference um, uh, surrounding um, uh, CCP uh, recognition, uh, examination, resiliency, um, while we also uh, acknowledge that uh, our regime is based off of um, intermediaries and infrastructure and registration, um, I think it's important to understand uh, how we can view that regime in the context of making sure we provide access to uh, U.S. clients to the best liquidity pools uh, possible. Uh, so I appreciate the balancing act um, that we may hear more about today. I'm very much looking forward, and thanks again for the opportunity to join you. Thank you, Commissioner Clinton. Commissioner Benham? Thanks, Andre, and good morning to everyone uh, on the GMAC. Uh, it's great to be with you and looking forward to today's discussion. Um, and of course, thanks to Commissioner Stump for her leadership and, and convening the, the meeting today as we end off the year. Andre, thanks to you, of course, um, as the as designated federal officer. And also um, thank you to Angie Corna for her chair and her leadership of the, the committee. Um, you know, really just kind of repeating what has been said already, but <clears throat> it's been great to see the GMAC convene over the past 12 months and really bring um, thoughtful recommendations to the commission, which we have taken action on, I think. Uh, everyone's benefited from that. And, and regarding today's agenda, um, as challenging as the early months of this year have been from a market's perspective and certainly um, dealing with, with the COVID pandemic um, from a work and personal perspective over the past few months as we emerge, hopefully in the, in the next few months and into 2021, um, I think we all, at least some of us, feel very confident that markets re responded well. Um, but certainly I think today's discussion will help us um, as we evaluate the lessons learned and think about what we can do better for next time. So very important discussion uh, and important timing to kick it off now as we end uh, 2020 and look into 2021, um, as always, to do better and build more strong, resilient markets, which, uh, of course, will benefit everyone uh, who's a part of this discussion today. So thanks again to everyone. and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Benham. Commissioner Berkovit. Thank you, Andre. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody, uh, depending on um, where, where one may be located. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here uh, today. Also, I, I, I will um, um, echo the sentiments expressed by um, uh, my, my fellow commissioners um, about the uh, productivity and, and the great work that this committee uh, has done. And I would I'd just like to know that I, I really think the way this committee has operated and, and, the, and the commission's uh, consideration of the committee's recommendations and the recent regulatory action uh, we took based on those recommendations really reflect uh, um, uh, excellence, I think, in, in, uh, in government uh, decision-making and public participation. In, in my mind, um, th this is um, really the way to develop sound um, uh, regulations with a strong con consensus for that approach. Um, the, the, the GMAC really represents um, a, a wide variety of, of expertise and experience and, and wisdom in, in the operation of our markets globally and um, uh, took the time, uh, made recommendations um, to the commission in, in a public meeting. Um, we, we put those recommendations out for public comment, received public comment, deliberated in a collegial fashion, and, and now um, with, within a space of, of a relatively um, short time frame, particularly in, in government decision-making time, we were able to uh, make those improvements to, uh, to our regulations uh, in, in the time of a, a COVID pandemic when there are all sorts of other priorities as well. So I think this is really, um, um, uh, I thank the committee uh, for their participation. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, Commissioner Stump uh, for her leadership in, in, in making this happen, um, from uh, uh, working uh, with the committee on the agenda of the committee to providing recommendations that are really useful 
uh, to the CFTC and really further the objective of um, uh, harmonization um, and liquidity in, in global markets. Uh, uh, that, that benefits not the U.S. markets, but the markets globally. And uh, without Commissioner Stump's efforts in this regard, um, it wouldn't have happened. So, uh, uh, Commissioner Stump, thank you for your leadership. And uh, uh, Angie, uh, Karna, and, and Andre Goldsmith, thank you for your, your leadership in, in making this happen as well. So, I'm looking forward to today's discussions and, and presentations. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berkovitz. Thanks again to all the commissioners for taking part in this meeting and for sharing your remarks with the GMAC. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we begin with our presentations today, I would like to do a roll call of GMAC members on the phone so that we have your attendance on the record. After I say your name and firm, please indicate that you are present. Uh, please don't forget to unmute your, your phone in order to speak. Chris Allen, Standard Chartered Bank. Hi, uh, yes, I'm here. Ted Backer, Morgan Stanley. Ashley Bellich, RBC Capital Markets. Present. Sean Bernardo, TPI Cap Seth. Darcy Bradbury, DE Shaw and Co. Here. Maria Chiodi, Credit Suisse Securities LLC. Here. Five Christensen, BP. Joe Suzuki, Better Market. Jim Colby, Coalition for Derivatives End Users. Barry Corcoran, RJ O'Brien and Associates. Sunil Coutinho, CME Clearing. David Goon, Inter Intercontinental Exchange, Inc. Here. Paul Hamill, Citadel Securities. Present. Amy Hong, Goldman Sachs. Present. John Horkin, LCH. Present. Adam Kanzler, IHS Market. Andy Karna, Nomura Securities International, Inc. Angie, I didn't hear you. I'm not sure if you have unmuted. Bob Klein, Citigroup. Yes, I'm here. Agnes Co, Singapore Exchange. Ben McDonald, Bloomberg LP. Present. Eric Tim Mueller, Eurex Clearing AG. Present. Joe Nicosia, Louis Dreyfus Company. Murray Posnanter, DTCC. Tom Sexton, National Futures Association. Present. Jessica Stoll, HC Technologies. Present. Shane Twiggs, Cargill Risk Management. Superna Vedbrat, BlackRock. Present. Masahiro Yamada, JP Morgan Securities. I'm present. Great, thank you. If there were any DMAC members who were unable to indicate your presence on the call, please email me or message me directly in WebEx um, to confirm your attendance for the record. With that, I'd like to turn the program over to Angie, um, GMAC Chair, for an introduction of our presenters on Panel 1. We seem to have we seem to be having a little bit of trouble hearing Angie. So why don't I go ahead and announce the the first presenters, and during that presentation, we'll get the technology straightened out. Um, just a few logistical reminders before the presenters start. Please keep your phones on mute while you're not speaking. 
Um, following the presentation, there will be an opportunity for GMAC members and commissioners to um, ask questions and discuss the presentation. If you would like to be recognized to speak, please use the WebEx chat icon on the bottom of the screen. Select all panelists, indicate that you have a question, and press enter. Please identify yourself and your firm prior to speaking and indicate when you are finished speaking. The first item on the agenda is a series of presentations on regulatory developments to advance global derivatives clearing. Our first panelists will be Abigail Knopf and August Imholtz, who are both special counsel in the, in the clearing policy branch in the Division of Clearing and Risk at the CFTC. Ms. Knopf and Mr. Imholtz will present on the CFTC's rulemaking concerning alternative compliance for non-U.S. derivatives clearing organizations. Please go ahead. Good morning, Commissioner Stump, Chairman Tarbert, and Commissioners Quinten, Spenham, and Berkovitz. My name is August M. Holtz. I'm an attorney in the Clearing Policy Branch of the Division of Clearing and Risk. My colleague, Abigail Knopf, who is also an attorney in the Clearing Policy Branch in DCR, and I will provide the GMAC with an overview of the Commission's recent rulemaking, Registration with Alternative Compliance for Non-U.S. Derivatives Clearing Organizations. In this rulemaking, the Commission amended its regulations to provide a second registration option for non-U.S. DCOs that clear swaps for U.S. persons, including for FCM customers, if those DCOs meet certain eligibility criteria. Prior to this rule, which became effective on November 20th of this year, the CFTC requirements did not distinguish among registered DCOs based on whether they are organized within or outside of the United States. Non-U.S. DCOs were subject to the same requirements in the Commodity Exchange Act and the Commission regulations that govern U.S. DCOs. This illustrates one of the two primary considerations that were fundamental in driving this rulemaking. First, the Commission recognized the existence of regulatory overlap. Non-U.S. DCOs were required to comply with both the U.S. regulatory regime and the regulatory regimes in their home countries. Second, the Commission also recognized that there are significant differences in the extent to which non-U.S. DCOs clear swaps for U.S. persons. To address these circumstances, the Commission added to its regulations a new registration and compliance framework in subpart D to permit a non-U.S. DCO to register with the Commission, yet comply with the DCO core principles through compliance with its home country regulatory regime, subject to certain conditions and limitations. Next slide, please. Uh, a a non-U.S. clearing organization that is applying for registration as a DCO subject to alternative compliance will be eligible if the clearing organization is in good regulatory standing in its home country, a memorandum of understanding or similar arrangement is in place between the commission and the clearing organization's home country regulator. The commission determines that the clearing organization's compliance with its home country regulatory regime will satisfy the DCO core principles in the Commodity Exchange Act. And the clearing organization does not, quote, does not pose a substantial risk to the U.S. financial system. Next slide, please. The commission may determine that a non-U.S. DCO poses substantial risk to the U.S. financial system if that DCO holds 20% or more of the required initial margin of U.S. clearing members for swaps across all registered and exempt DCOs and 20% or more of the initial margin requirements for swaps at that DCO is from U.S. clearing members. Where a DCO is at or near the 20% threshold, the Commission 
has discretion as to whether the DCO would would or would not be eligible for alternative compliance. The substantial risk test uses the term U.S. clearing member, which means a clearing member of a non-U.S. DCO that is either an FCM or organized in the United States or a non-U.S. entity whose ultimate parent company is orga organized in the U.S. A bit of background and context about the substantial risk test. The first prong is designed to address systemic risk. Uh, the, permission, the commission's primary systemic risk concern arises from the potential for loss of clearing services for a significant part of the U.S. swaps market in the event of a catastrophic occurrence affecting the DCO. The second prong of the test is intended to respect international comedy by ensuring that the substantial risk test captures only those non-U.S. DCOs with clearing activity attributable to U.S. clearing members sufficient to warrant more active oversight by the commission. Overall, the substantial risk test is designed to better calibrate the Commission's oversight of non-U.S. DCOs based on the principle of deference to their home country regulators, while at the same time taking into consideration risk to, the, to U.S. clearing members and ultimately risk to the U.S. financial system. For context, of the 15 DCOs currently registered with the Commission, Five are organized outside of the United States, but only three would be eligible to pursue registration under the alternative compliance framework. Uh, one of those five clears futures traded on a DCM, and the other is one of the largest DCOs in the world and is likely to pose a substantial risk to the U.S. financial system. So now that I've discussed the purpose of the registration with alternative compliance framework and which DCOs are eligible to register as a subpart D DCO. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Abigail to discuss the regulatory requirements and procedures for the alternative compliance framework, beginning with the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you, August. This slide gives a high-level comparison of the requirements for DCOs registered under the original registration framework and the alternative compliance framework. There are two notable differences. First, while all registered DCOs are subject to the DCO core principles in the CEA, a subpart D DCO is able to comply with the DCO core principles through compliance with the applicable legal requirements in its home country. A subpart D DCO does not have to comply with each of the Commission's implementing regulations in subparts B and C of Part 39. A subpart D DCO, however, must comply with all of the conditions in its order of registration. The second notable difference is that the Commission has exempted subpart D DCOs from the rule submission requirements in Part 40, with the exceptions of rule filings related to customer protection and swap data reporting rule changes. All registered DCOs must comply with the Part 45 swap data reporting requirements. Next slide. Additionally, as shown in the previous slide, all registered DCOs, including subpart D DCOs, must comply with the Commission's customer protection regime, which includes Section 40F of the CEA, Parts 1 and 22, and Section 3915 for the treatment of funds. U.S. customers must clear through FCMs at a subpart D DCO, and all DCOs, including subpart D DCOs, must comply with the CEA and Commission regulations, which are designed to protect the safety of funds and assets belonging to clearing members and their customers. Next slide. While an applicant for registration under the original registration framework must file numerous and extensive exhibits, a subpart D DCO applicant will only need to file a select list of exhibits. The most notable exhibit is the regulatory compliance chart, in which an applicant would state the citation and full text of the home country regulator's applicable legal requirements and an explanation of how the applicant complies with each DCO core principle. If the home country regulatory regime lacks legal requirements that correspond to a particular DCO core principle, the applicant would need to explain how it would satisfy that DCO core principle. Next slide. In order of registration for a subpart D DCO will contain certain conditions. First, as discussed previously, 
The DCO must comply with the statutory DCO core principles, the Commission's customer protection regime, the Part 45 swap data reporting requirements, the general DCO provisions in Subpart A of Part 39, all requirements in Subpart D of Part 39, and the conditions in this list. Second, DCOs must comply with the open access requirements to treat swaps with the same terms and conditions as economically equivalent, allow offset to the extent permitted at the DCO, and provide non-discriminatory clearing for swaps executed bilaterally or on unaffiliated platforms. A third condition, a DCO must consent to the U.S. jurisdiction and designate, authorize, and identify an agent for service of process in the U.S. and promptly report any change of its U.S. agent. Fourth, a DCO must comply with and demonstrate compliance with any condition upon the Commission's request. A DCO must also make all books and records open to inspection and copying by a Commission representative, including, including promptly making these books and records directly available to the Commission. The Commission must receive a written representation of good regulatory standing from the DCO's home country regulator within 60 days of the DCO's fiscal year end, and finally, the Commission may add other conditions based on any other facts and circumstances that deems relevant. The Commission will consider the degree of deference that the home country regulator extends to the Commission's oversight of U.S. DCOs in determining whether to extend the benefits of alternative compliance to the DCOs in that jurisdiction. The Commission will consider this degree of deference both initially when registering a subpart D DCO and when determining whether compliance under the framework should continue. Next slide. Subpart D DCOs have periodic and event-specific reporting requirements as shown here, and these DCOs must provide any other information that the Commission deems necessary, including but not limited to information for the Commission to evaluate the DCO's continued eligibility as a, a Subpart D DCO, review the DCO's compliance with conditions in the order of registration, and conduct oversight of U.S. clearing activity. The event-specific reporting requirements are more limited than the requirements for DCOs registered under the original registration format framework. Next slide. Finally, the Commission codified procedures to permit it in its own discretion and upon its own initiative to modify the terms and conditions of a subpart D DCO's order of registration if there are changes to or omissions in the facts or circumstances pursuant to which the order was issued or if any terms and conditions of the order have not been met. For example, if the DCO fails to remain in good regulatory standing, poses a substantial risk to the U.S. financial system, or the home country regulatory regime no longer satisfies the statutory DCO core principles, the Commission would provide notice to the subpart D DCO of its intention to modify the order of registration. This concludes our prepared remarks on the registration with alternative compliance framework. I note that in addition to adopting this final rule this fall, the Commission also codified its existing approach to exempt DCOs, whereby a non-U.S. DCO is permitted to clear only proprietary swaps for U.S. persons. August and I are happy to answer any questions about the rule during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knopf and Mr. Imholtz. And apologies for the technical issues earlier. Our second panelist is Patrick Pearson, Head of Financial Markets Infrastructure at the European Commission, who will present on the finalization of EMIR 2.2 and ESMA's engagement with the CFTC on EMIR 2.2. Please go ahead, Mr. Pearson. Mr. Pearson, are you on the line? Mr. Pearson, if you're on, please press star zero. Mr. Pearson, your line is now open. Thank you very much and apologies for the glitch. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Thank you very much. 
Um, I'd like to thank uh, first and foremost Commissioner Stump uh, for the kind invitation to speak. I think this has been my fourth or fifth uh, GMAC over the past years, and they've always been a very helpful and a welcome uh, opportunity for the European Commission to speak on these important matters. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about our recent regulatory efforts on regulating uh, third country DCOs. And like the CFTC, we in the European Union have been looking at uh, how to consider risk posed by non-EU DCOs uh, operating on our markets, um, if they pose risk, which risks, and what would be the consequences. And all of this against the backdrop of uh, deference. Uh, very important uh, for uh, global markets with global actors and uh, global business. The first thing we did uh, was to look at uh, whether systemic risk uh, could arise uh, from non-EU DCOs operating in our markets. And uh, in doing that, we immediately looked at which risks we would think would be relevant. And uh, we picked up about uh, eight or nine uh, eight or nine specific risks that we listed as potentially relevant in determining if a, a DCO from outside of Europe uh, would operate in our markets that we need, need to take into account. Now, the first is the nature of the transactions, uh, the complexity, the risk profile, the maturity of those uh, transactions that are offered uh, in the European Union. Uh, the second uh, element that we looked at was, well, what would the effect of a failure or disruption of a third country DCO uh, be on the stability of the European Union's financial markets? Uh, we also looked at the structure of a DCO's clearing membership. Um, how transparent is it? Uh, how di diverse is it? Uh, we looked at the uh, extent to which, importantly, a DCO's clearing would involve trades denominated in the euro or in other union currencies for member countries in Europe that aren't part of the eurozone like Poland or Sweden. We looked at whether there would be alternative DCOs offering similar services to those offered by a non-EU DCO in the European markets. And finally, we looked at well, how exposed would EU participants and EU clients be to a DCO from a third country? Now, a whole list of incredibly complex issues that we needed to consider. So how did we go about this? Well, the first thing we did was we reached out to fellow regulators uh, across the, uh, the, the globe. Um, we spoke to our colleagues in uh, many jurisdictions um, I think uh, it's quite fair to say that we spent quite a considerable amount of time with our uh, colleagues in the CFTC. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, the colleagues in the CFTC, in parallel to our efforts, uh, have been looking at essentially uh, similar issues. Uh, how do uh, non-US DCOs uh, pose risk to your markets and your system in the US? So we have had a lot of conversations uh, we both learned uh, and we both listened and I think it's fair to say that uh, certainly in our regulation that was published uh, this summer you can even pick up uh, the fruits of those uh, bilateral conversations we had with many regulators and uh, also with those uh, in the CFTC. Let me give you a few examples and the first thing that uh, we learned uh, and that was confirmed to us by colleagues uh, in the CFTC was that when you look at risk in your markets, uh, there are some risks that do not uh, objectively pose uh, financial stability risk uh, in your own market. And you will find uh, that very important principle uh, in our law, where we specifically uh, refer to the fact that agricultural products uh, listed and executed on uh, what we call regulated markets in third countries um, which largely serve domestic and non-financial counterparties, uh, are not uh, transactions that pose significant risk. Uh, I think we even use the words they pose negligible risk to the clearing members and the trading venues in the European Union. So that's uh, something uh, very, very, uh, I think, uh, prominent that we picked up uh, quite early on in our discussions with our colleagues in, uh, in the CFTC. 
But then the second uh, and, three, uh, and third uh, issues that we, we picked up, a good example is that we learned very quickly after intense discussions with colleagues in the CFTC that it's one thing to put regulation out there in which you try to determine what financial stability risks are, and it's another to try and apply and implement that to the participants in the markets. Because what the participants in the markets are looking for is transparency. And uh, the best way to achieve that, we learned from the CFTC, was through quantitative indicators, quantitative thresholds. Uh, you have your 2020 rule. We didn't copy that rule, but we certainly went home uh, to Europe with a very clear understanding that that's the only and the best and the most propitious way to regulate. And that's why uh, what we uh, did introduce in our uh, own rules uh, is a series of quantitative indicators, quantitative thresholds, if you will, to determine exactly when uh, a DCO from a third country uh, would uh, objectively pose uh, a systemic risk uh, in the European Union. Uh, we decided to look at four specific indicators. Uh, we decided to look at the uh, amount of open interest of securities transactions. Uh, we decided, secondly, to look at the uh, maximum notional outstanding uh, of derivative uh, transactions or swap transactions, as you call them, denominated in union currencies. Uh, we also needed to look at uh, the average aggregated margin requirements and default fund contributions um, for accounts held at the third country DCO by European Union clearing members. Uh, obviously to measure and to mitigate uh, external risk for our uh, banks and other clearing members. And finally, we wanted to look at the uh, largest payment obligations uh, that had been entered into uh, by union uh, entities. These were very, very uh, clear, uh, we think, uh, indicators and useful indicators for us to measure uh, risk and to determine whether a third country DCO uh, would be of systemic importance to us in the European Union or not. And why is that important? Uh, it's important because we have a very simple system in our rules and regulations in Europe. If you are not systemically important, uh, you are what we would call a tier one DCO, in essence, nothing changes. Uh, the full uh, panoply of deference of European Union rules will continue to apply uh, to a DCO from that jurisdiction full mutual recognition, full deference, uh, no change essentially to the current supervisory approach. It's business as usual. However, if we do determine that a DCO from the third country uh, does hit one or more of those quantitative thresholds, then uh, you could be determined as a tier two DCO, which is a systemically important uh, DCO. And that has significant consequences because that means that the systemic importance that that DCO poses to our financial system uh, brings with it a number of requirements and a number of uh, rules and agreements that need to be in place for that uh, DCO to continue to operate in the European Union. It even uh, can go further than that if you are tier two and you meet further specific requirements you can uh, enter uh, into a system of tier two plus DCO regulation uh, in which there are even stricter requirements, possibly uh, including uh, a possible requirement for European participants to only clear uh, certain trades uh, with uh, a DCO uh, on, uh, established uh, in the European Union. So that's how we set about this. And I, I must say, and in all honesty, the many conversations uh, with the CFTC, uh, with Chairman Tarbot, with the Director, or Director of uh, International Affairs, uh, Mr. Suyash Paliwal, Paliwal and uh, Mr. Tom Benison from the Chairman's Office over the past year or so, uh, actually uh, guided us in the European Union to, to come up uh, together with comments from other regulators to a system that we think is fair, that is transparent, uh, and that is uh, uh, equitable as well. And those open and collegial cooperation discussions that we've had, I think, but I uh, am also confirmed in this, have led us to the conclusion in the European Union that on the basis of those objective indicators, uh, we have not been able to identify uh, a US DCO 
uh, as being of systemic importance for the European Union. Uh, operationally, that simply means that uh, US DCOs uh, will continue uh, to operate on our markets uh, with full deference as uh, before. And uh, I think uh, what Chairman Tarbert and Mr. C.S. Paniwal and Mr. Benson have applied is a, a wonderful principle. Uh, we uh, have a mutual love of um, William Shakespeare, and as we all know, uh, he once wrote, love all, trust a few, and do wrong to them. All is well that ends well. So that is uh, the uh, key uh, element of our legislation uh, that uh, was published over the summer. Now, that legislation needs to be uh, operational, and uh, in order to do that, the European Commission has set up a, a new and a separate uh, supervisory authority within the uh, ESMA framework uh, that will apply and implement uh, these rules and requirements and uh, will be the, uh, the talking point for uh, third country regulators, uh, including the, uh, the CFTC. Now, the new chairman of that group, uh, Mr. Klaus Lober, uh, is unable to join us today. He has a, a board meeting uh, with ESMA in Paris, uh, but he's uh, certainly asked me to uh, pass on the message that uh, he is open for business and he is really looking forward to continuing a, a very good and helpful working relationship with the CFTC. Uh, I think my 10 minutes are up um, and I'll stop there, Commissioner Stump. Thank you very much, Mr. Pearson. Our final panelist for panel one is Mr. Takashi Nagaoka, Deputy Commissioner for International Affairs at the Japan Financial Services Agency. Please go ahead, Mr. Nagaoka. Well, uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Stump, for a very kind introduction. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the CFTC for inviting me today to the renowned Global Market um, Advisory Committee meeting and providing me with the opportunity to speak about CCP's cross-border supervision and deference. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to touch upon the usual but important disclaimer, i.e. Uh, the views and opinions expressed in this panel discussion are those of myself and do not necessarily uh, reflect the official policy or position of JFSA. Now, uh, let me begin. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we experienced an extremely volatile market this past March, and this in turn has allowed us to reconfirm the importance of the role of CCP's play within the financial system. And while steps to make CCP more resilient continue to be discussed internationally, I believe that uh, from a cross-border provision uh, perspective, CFTC's recent rulemakings, including that on the exempt DCO, are very important and crucial work. Uh, today, I'd like to speak about a few points, uh, maybe slightly diverging from uh, what Commissioner Stump has kindly introduced, but uh, they will be uh, the on ongoing international discussions on market fragmentation and some of the initiatives in Japan, as well as the topic of the U.S. investors' access to the Japan market in relation to exempt DCO. So um, let me first explain a bit on, on what is currently being discussed internationally regarding market fragmentation. Uh, many of the participants may be well aware of the subject already, but in any event, uh, let us have a look at these important developments again. Uh, going back a few years, under the Japanese presidency of uh, 2019 G20, uh, we included addressing market fragmentation as one of the priorities in the G20 finance track. And FSB and IOSCO published reports respectively on this particular issue in mid-2019. This in turn has created the momentum for FSB and IOSCO to review how the rules and restrictions created by different jurisdictions are contributing to the market fragmentation and how we will be uh, um, approaching this issue going forward. As part of such an initiative, IOSCO's market fragmentation follow-up group, which Japan currently co-chairs with Quebec AMF, uh, was tasked to review and identify good and sound practices regarding deference of regulation and supervision between jurisdictions and published a report in uh, June this year. The concept of uh, deference has been viewed as an effective way uh, to mitigate market fragmentation, but uh, the review process is often time-consuming and at times uh, lacks transparency and clarity. 
the good and sound practices provided in the uh, published report would provide useful clues for relevant authorities to improve the processes for deference determinations by making them more efficient. The report carries huge significance in that it provides the direction and momentum in terms of fostering common understanding and mutual cooperation among authorities, and thus avoiding market fragmentation that could uh, cause undue burden and undermine market efficiency. Now with that, uh, I would like to discuss some of the uh, initiatives in Japan in relation to foreign CCPs. Uh, Japan currently has a two-tier system for allowing uh, foreign CCPs to operate their uh, client business in the Japanese financial market. Uh, in principle, foreign CCPs are required to obtain a license prior to their operation. However, uh, there is also an exemption system where um, foreign CCPs may be exempted from licensing itself subject to the condition that default of the creeling uh, transactions would have a minor impact on Japan's capital market. Uh, both channels are designed so as to take into account deference to the home regulator's regulation and supervision over the foreign CCPs and avoiding regulatory overlap, overlaps which may become a barrier for the foreign CCPs to enter. Uh, with respect to the licensing system, um, requirements applicable to foreign CCPs are much more lenient uh, compared to the requirements for domestic CCPs. In particular, um, foreign CCPs are exempted from the minimal capital requirements, nor do we require them to set up a physical office within Japan. As mentioned in the previous part of my speech, uh, such a treatment is described as one of the effective approaches for cross-border regulation in the IOSCO's report on market fragmentation published in June last year. On the exemption from licensing or the exemption system, um, we made some revisions in June this year, uh, reflecting the discussion at the international fora. In short, uh, while the exemption status used to be uh, reviewed every six months, this revision uh, this time around allow, allows the uh, exemptions to be granted without time limitation, subject to an additional condition that cooperation arrangements with relevant competent authorities of the third co uh, country have been established. This change was welcomed by the market participants as it offers uh, stability and predictability for uh, risk management purposes and is expected to uh, facilitate a smoother cross-border transactions going forward. This exemption system was also referred to in the IOSCO's report, Good Practices on Processes for Deference, uh, published this June. Uh, currently, uh, U.S. CCPs provide their uh, CDS and repo clearing services to Japanese investors under this exemption system. Under this um, two-tier system, uh, we granted a license to Eurex in March uh, this year. Uh, in the midst of persisting uncertainties pertaining to Brexit and uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this new licensing was well received by market participants, especially from risk mitigation uh, perspective. In the same context, uh, the revision of the exemption system based on the difference to the foreign CCP's home jurisdiction was also welcomed by the market participants as it made it easier for them to use the foreign clearing system for managing their risks with added stability. As you can see, uh, taking in it into account of the uh, discussions at the international fora, our regime for foreign CCPs has been updated and subject to home regulators' cooperation offers enhanced accessibility to markets. Uh, the update aims to provide market participants with broader choice in terms of risk management without compromising financial stability. Uh, we also expect it to stimulate uh, fair competition among uh, CCPs for the benefit of investors, including via Im an improvement of the quality of services and cost reduction, among others. Now I'd like to briefly touch upon the recently finalized exempt DCO role in the U.S. I understand that uh, upon finalization of the exempt DCO role by CFTC last month, uh, Chairman Taubert has expressed his support on continued discussion on whether to permit uh, exempt DCO to uh, clear certain non-U.S. dollar denominated swaps for uh, U.S. customers. And okay. Would, uh, 
uh, and I would expect that on such discussion will continue. I believe that our mission as regulators is to maintain financial stability and ensure customer protection while enhancing better market access by uh, investors through avoidance of harmful market fragmentation. On that basis, we welcome uh, further consideration by CFTC on this issue and its future uh, rulemaking processes. Uh, Japan is very much looking forward to working with CFTC and other authorities uh, to accomplish our mission um, to create open uh, derivatives globally. Well, um, I'll stop here. Yeah, I'm going to send the boys out. Uh, thank you very much. Up in the attic. I'm up in the in our as, as a reminder, if yeah. you're not speaking, could you okay. please put right, your cool. phones on mute? Thank We're you. getting some. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. or commissioner wishes to speak, please use the WebEx chat icon at the bottom of your screen and select all panelists as your option within the drop-down menu. Well, to start us off, in the presentations, we heard a discussion of how the U.S. and the EU have approached regulatory deference when it comes to the supervision of CCPs outside their jurisdictions, as well as similar feedback from uh, Mr. Nagaoka. In your view, are the varying approaches to regulatory deference sound? Do they go far enough in allowing a home country regulator to take the primary role in supervising the CCPs in their own jurisdiction? And that's a question for all panelists, as well as uh, anybody else who has any feedback from the, from the uh, committee. Chairman Karna, this is Robert Klein at, um, at Citigroup. I, I have a, a comment and some questions if I could be recognized. Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Klein. Thanks. First of all, I mean, in in response, I was I was gratified to hear the the reminder from Mr. Nagaoka that uh, as part of the exempt DCO rules and and as part of Chairman Tarbert's comments on those rules, the there is at least an opportunity for further discussion around client access to exempt DCOs. Um, and I'd like to note that you know Citigroup is certainly aware of significant interest by U.S. institutional clients in accessing um, Japanese yen-denominated swaps clearing in particular on JSCC. Um, so we would certainly encourage the CFTC, the JFSA, and the, and the JSCC to continue their dialogue to see if there is a practical um, and safe avenue for permitting U.S. client access to exempt DCOs. So, in, you know, in that spirit, I, I, if, if I can continue, I do have a, a couple of questions from Mr. Nagaoka. Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Klein. Okay. I, I, I guess, you know, the JSCC has certainly um, advocated for U.S. person access to clearing in Japan under an exempt DCO route. Um, but one of the factors that's been a concern, as I understand it, uh, is whether client margin posted by U.S. clients into Japan would receive protection that is you know, equivalent to the U.S. protections if that margin were held by JSCC clearing firms. Um, the JSCC, I think, has asserted that their segregation model should provide equivalent or better protection for clients. And I, my, my question is, is, is there a way that the JFSA and the CFTC could work together to um, get the U.S. regulators comfortable with how the Japanese client money protection regime works and the level of protection that it would afford to U.S. clients were they to clear uh, on JSCC? Uh, may I respond? Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Nagy. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Klein, for your uh, question. Uh, uh, I understand that it is important to consider protection of U.S. customers as 
uh, customer's assets from the events such as a failure uh, clearing mon members of an exempt DCO uh, when thinking about U.S. customer's access to clearing outside the U.S. And under the Japanese regulation, a client margin is segregated at the clearing member level as well as CCP level. I think you're familiar with it, um, with it already uh, from the JFCC, uh, JFCC's explanation, but uh, that's the um, uh, basics. Uh, the regime is complemented and reinforced by JFCC's relevant rules uh, whose enforceability is supported by the uh, Financial Instruments and uh, Exchange Act, that's the security law in Japan. And uh, compliance with the requirement for segregation is monitored by the regulator uh, ourselves as well. And the law also clearly uh, provides for a preferred claim in uh, bankruptcy in the event of a failure of a claiming member. So uh, collectively, I think there is uh, sufficient uh, protection for uh, the U.S. Uh, clients. And I would not go into details of our regime here, but uh, we are happy to discuss further with CFTC to help having a better picture of mutual regulatory and supervisory frameworks. Um, where uh, it is common and where there are differences and how those differences could be uh, could be uh, uh, filled in. Uh, if the private sector has any specific issues needing clarification, uh, apart from the questions just uh, we had from Mr. Klein, uh, we'll be happy to receive your, uh, such inquiries uh, as well, uh, either directly or through uh, CFTC. Um, I would like to repeat that we will be uh, very much happy to uh, discuss further with CFTC on the qualifications that is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagaoka. Mr. Klein, do you have any follow-up before I go to the next question? Okay. One, one follow-up question. Um, it, it, in Europe, we've seen one example, Urex, which has obtained a full DCO registration with the CFTC and is offering you know, essentially parallel clearing models. Um, again, a question for Mr. Nagaoka or, or others. Um, it, what's the biggest hurdle for um, JFSA or JSCC to support a full JSCC registration as a DCO as opposed to looking at the exempt DCO avenue? Well, um, thank you, Mr. Klein, again, for a good question. and. I must say that I'm not so familiar with the two parallel clearing model employed by Eurex, and this cannot uh, actually make any comparisons based on that. But uh, in general, uh, when we talk about um, entry of foreign CCPs, uh, we need to look at differences in the legal systems of respective jurisdictions uh, with regard to, for example, uh, segregation of customer assets and bankruptcy procedures, among others, uh, which form the basis for supporting clearing model. And I will refrain from making guesses here because we don't really have a specific picture in front of us. Uh, but going forward, if JSCC comes to consider application for a full DCO in the new environment with the new uh, exempt DCO role in place, and if C uh, CFTC as a home regulator is uh, welcome to discuss it, uh, we, the JFSA, will be happy to work with them on the matter and then identify uh, what actually is the hurdle and how we uh, how we could actually overcome those hurdles. So um, it's uh, something that we foresee in the future, but uh, sorry, I cannot really have a clear uh, response at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagioka. Ms. Bedbrat, do you have some comments to add to the discussion? Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the panelists for the hard work that they have done in bringing, um, you know, some light to this very important topic and for the commission to bring this um, to the GMAT as um, an important discussion topic. Um, you know, so what, what I'd like to do is give uh, a little bit of perspective on, um, you know, the topics that we discussed. Uh, keeping in mind uh, the end client uh, or the end investor. Um, as a fiduciary, BlackRock wants to be able to access uh, the highest quality of CCPs that offer the best liquidity um, for our end clients. And to that um, you know, end, we do favor policies that enable healthy competition among high-quality CCPs in different jurisdictions. 
We're also highly encouraged by the work that regulators have done to consider common um, international standards on CCP su supervision, recovery, and resolution, given the global nature of our uh, you know, markets in general. Um, the one piece that you know, we just want to be able to highlight is that local policies um, that may artificially fragment our markets they will potentially lead to higher costs and you know ultimately you know could lead to greater risks um you know for clients so if we could just you know keep that in mind uh, um as we are uh, defining um uh you know local uh, regulation um the other uh, thought that i would like to um make a comment on is um our discussion on the alternative uh, compliance you know, while we don't necessarily uh, feel that this will make a material impact um, on our clearing strategy, um, we already uh, have access to many non-US uh, domicile CCPs such as LCH uh, and, uh, and UREX that are fully registered and regulated uh, by the CFTC. But, you know, as my fellow panelists have, um, you know, have highlighted, um, you know, access to the uh, JSCC, um, you know, is something that we all want to work uh, towards making um, much more uh, seamless for um, U.S. Uh, you know, for the for the U.S. client. Um, you know, there's there's been um, you know migration of uh, liquidity uh, from um, LCH uh, to. Uh, uh, to the JSCC um, CCP, which is essentially, um, you know, created a, a basis between, um, you know, the uh, uh, the, uh, the um, offerings on both the CCPs, and as a result, um, you know, this could create a competitive disadvantage for U.S. customers, um, you know, and it may also, uh, you know, make um, uh, it's less efficient to be able to hedge, uh, you know, the, the, the risk. So that is something that, you know, we would, uh, uh, we would encourage, um, you know, more dialogue uh, so that we're able to, um, you know, make it accessible to the U.S. Uh, uh, to the U.S. customers um, in a much more meaningful way. Um, and then um, um, my last comment is, uh, um, you know, regarding the Tier 2 Plus uh, uh, designation um, that uh, you know we may see some of uh, uh, you know some of the CCPs being uh, deemed um, the you know there is a little concern that this could dampen market competition and client uh, choice and you know it could actually increase in a different type of systemic uh, risk um, due to like forced migration and fragmented uh, uh, you know, market liquidity, um, and uh, you know, to some extent, it can also, um, you know, lead to an increased uh, uh, cost um, to the end client due to uh, splitting, you know, of margin models um, and uh, potential migration costs. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bedbrett. Mr. Coutinho, do you have some comments to add to the discussion? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. I think I just have a comment, but I don't have any questions. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the CFTC and uh, the European Commission for working together to um, achieve mutual recognition the second time around, um, as well as achieving uh, a level of deference. And I think this is a balanced approach. Um, we strongly believe in that because uh, the uh, laws in each one of the jurisdictions are never the same, and it can result in significant conflicts between international regulations and local laws. So um, I think I think that um, we've done quite a bit since the global financial crisis in creating standards bodies. Um, and regulators all around the world, whether they are prudential regulators as well as market regulators, uh, work together to establish the standards 
So to the extent that each regulation adapts those standards to their local laws, uh, then deference is the most practical, pragmatic, and the best way moving forward. So thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Coutinho. Mr. Yamada, do you have any comments to add to the discussion? Yes, thank you. Um, first off, I, I wanted to echo those thanks. Um, we, we definitely applaud the close relationships that the CFTC has developed over the course of Chairman Harbert's tenure here and believe that you know the progress we've made uh, to really enshrining the regulatory principles of deference and equivalence have been tremendous and, and clearly are the, the fact that we've got such strong global presence on the panel here is evidence of, of that progress. Um, the one point I would make, um, particularly around the, the, the topic of global consistency and coordination, we, you know, the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Um, the progress is clearly, um, or the proposals here clearly do help enshrine um, the principles of safety and soundness of the system. There are still a few points mentioned by our city colleagues where there's a little bit of room for improvement here. Um, in particular, I'm sorry. Mr. Yamada, are you still on the line? Mr. Yamada, did we lose you? All right, hopefully we'll get Mr. Yamada back in a minute. But in the meantime, does anyone else have any questions or comments for our panelists? Hi, Angie. This is Commissioner Stump. I just wanted to ask among the committee members if anyone might like to discuss for the benefit of those who may not be aware or even for the benefit of the commission, um, the manner in which we've distinguished clearing for the clearing requirements for CCPs abroad with regard to OTC swaps as opposed to futures. Um, I, I just think that might be worthwhile if there's anyone on the committee who might like to speak to that. Um, and if not, that's fine too. But since we we have a few minutes here, I just thought I would ask if anyone on the committee might like to address um, the, the manner in which we handle um, foreign CCP recognition with regard to clearing futures and, and, and how we've handled that in the past. This is Bob Klein. I mean, I can I can provide a little bit of information um, if that would be helpful. Yes, that would be great, Mr. Klein. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, there, there, and thank you for the the question, Commissioner Stump. There, there is a distinction, as I'm as I'm sure you and the staff are well aware. In the future side, um, there are two ways that U.S. clients can uh, access non-U.S. clearinghouses. Um, and, and those those two methods have existed for quite some time now. The, the first is to um, establish a clearing relationship with the USFCM that uh, has a effectively a correspondent or indirect clearing relationship with a member of the non-US CCP um, and clears the client trades through that correspondent or indirect clearing relationship in which case the USFCM will hold the customer funds subject to part 30 of the commission's rules, um, which has a, a bankruptcy protection and other requirements that are analogous, but not exactly the same as those for segregated funds held for margin on, on uh, fully regulated BCOs. 
Um, the second method is that in some instances, the commission has granted what amounts to an equivalency determination for certain foreign regulators, including uh, some foreign CCPs. And under those so-called Part 30 determinations, U.S. clients can uh, deal directly with a non-FCM member of the foreign CCP, provided that that member falls within the Part 30 equivalency determination. And the U.S. client would then uh, establish a direct relationship with the non-U.S. clearing firm, post margin to that non-U.S. clearing firm, and be fully subject to the non-U.S. regulatory requirements um, that the commission has deemed to be equivalent. Um, so that's quite a bit different from the, the cleared swaps area where effectively there is no permitted indirect clearing unless, unless all clearing members in the chain are FCMs and clients cannot access clearing on a non-U.S. CCP unless that CCP is fully registered as a DCO um, and permits FCMs to become members. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Commissioner Stump, did you have a follow-up? I have a couple of other um, people who want to provide some feedback as well. Um, well, I do have a follow-up, um, and Bob, you can take this one, or you can ask one of the other clearing members on, on the in the group to to take it. I, you've done a great job of describing the distinctions that have been made with regard to OTC and um, listed futures, um, and, and the manner in which we, as a regulator, have enabled access in those different um, formats. I I would be interested to know if the um, the FCMs who are engaged in the um, utilizing Part 30 um, to enable their clients to access clearinghouses abroad that are not registered with the CFTC, um, you know, they, they must have some mechanism by which they disclose to their clients that they may or may not be protected under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code. And, and while I'm not just making any statements about whether or not they are protected under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code. I would be curious as to how um, FCM handle that today as they maybe perhaps disclose to clients what is, is the, what may or may not occur in the event of a bankruptcy at a, a CCP abroad uh, on the listed side. This is Bob Klein. I'm happy to take a shot at that, but would welcome input from other firms. Um, I, I think on the on the listed future side, again, there, given the fact that there are two models, if if clients are documenting with an FCM and using an, what I'll refer to as an indirect clearing methodology, there is in fact disclosure that's provided by FCMs of the the relevant risks of dealing on the foreign markets. However, the, the client funds are, in fact, protected under Part 190 in the Bankruptcy Code. They're just protected as what are referred to as secured funds rather than segregated funds. Where the, where the client chooses to deal directly with a non-U.S. firm that is a member of the CCP in reliance on a Part 30 equivalency determination, um, that disclosure is, is governed by um, the relevant rules of the local market. Um, and I think it varies from case to case, and, and clients, you know, have to evaluate, you know, what disclosures they're getting and, and what kind of, um, you know, what kind of information they feel they need. But, but happy to hear comments from other clearing firms. Hi, this is Maria Chiodi, if I may join Bob's. Yes, comments. please go ahead, Ms. Chiodi. So, so on top of that, um, back in 2014-ish or so. The CFTC promulgated the enhanced property protection rules, so to bolster some of the protections for Part 30, like residual interest, et cetera. But I think what Bob described was, you know, again, not commenting on the bankruptcy code and not a bankruptcy lawyer. You know, if you're dealing with the FCM, you are within CFTC Part 190 and the U.S. Bankruptcy Code. If a client, a U.S. client documents or clears directly with a non-U.S. clearing firm, then not so much, right? You're completely outside of the bankruptcy code, if that makes sense. In the yes. U.S., anyway. Thank you, Ms. Um, 
Ms. Bedbrett, do you have some insights on this question? Um, yes, you know, I just, uh, you know, wanted to add a little bit uh, from a risk perspective, um, you know, as we uh, look at the markets, both, uh, you know, for indirect uh, clearing through our US FCMs, um, you know, it's very important to, uh, you know, to see what type of risk um, you're, uh, you know, bringing uh, into uh, your clearing relationship, like for us, uh, you know, what we, we try to do is, you know, obviously we will, um, you know, we will make sure that the FCMs that we are engaging with, um, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, robust uh, risk management methodology. But, you know, the other component of it um, that, um, you know, we, we, we focus on is making sure that for markets where, um, you know, we do require indirect clearing, um, you know, uh, that, you know, we encourage our FCMs to have more than one relationship, um, you know, for that indirect uh, uh, clearing, because there are elements of indirect clearing that is passed on to the end client. And, you know, you want to be able to avoid um, a situation where that, indi you know, if that indirect clearer for whatever reason isn't able to clear, um, you're not in a situation that, um, you know, you're you're unable to uh, either clear your transactions or, you know, to de-risk, uh, um, you know, if you hold positions. You know, it's something that we have observed in the past, but that's, you know, something that, you know, uh, the Commission could take, um, you know, into consideration is to have, um, you know, requirement of more than one indirect relationship. Thank you, Ms. Bedbrett. Mr. Coutinho? I think um, Bob Bob did a wonderful job of covering the perspective of members. Um, I have only very little to add, but uh, as a fact, the CFTC does provide um, full recognition and deference when it comes to futures for foreign board of trade um, as well. So there is no registration required for the underlying clearing organization as long as it belongs to a jurisdiction that the CFTC recognizes as equivalent. And there is a registration, of course, but it's a different form of registration, but it is at uh, um, uh, contract market level and not at the clearing level. Thank you, Mr. Coutinho. Mr. Yamada? Yes, apologies for the, the glitch earlier. Um, I, I would reiterate that it does feel like um, the FCM model, which is effectively an omnibus model, does seem to be an effective and, and somewhat proven template upon which um, we could address many of the concerns uh, that the representative um, from Japan um, and some of the issues that they were looking into. There, there is a model for this, and it appears to be um, somewhat proven. It obviously worked through the recent turmoil. So perhaps this would be something um, for further investigation as, as a potential model for some of the, the issues that, that you mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Yamada. Mr. Mueller? Yes, thank you very much, Eric Mueller, your ex clearing. I would like to uh, also make a comment, if I may. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I'd like to uh, also congratulate uh, the CFTC and the EU Commission for reaching their accord uh, uh, on this uh, subject matter. I think as pointed out by uh, Sunil, one of um, our fellow peers, uh, there is a difference indeed in the way uh, we can register as a foreign uh, board of trade uh, versus the registration process um, for OTC IRS clearing um, that uh, we are a, full, um, a fully licensed DCO in that area. And uh, that, I think, is still, uh, there is a difference to being a Tier 1 EU CCP and obviously uh, the obligations under the uh, full DCO, certainly, but I think also under the um, under the alternative uh, route that is presented 
today. So I think it's still sort of not a 100% level playing field, but in practice, I think the CFTC has been very um, uh, yeah, reasonable in uh, uh, effecting uh, the theoretical rights uh, that there are under the full DCO. So we feel it's something that in practice uh, we can well uh, live with and therefore are grateful that these topics could be um, resolved in a way acceptable to both jurisdictions. So for us, it's certainly a basis to be able to operate. Uh, that's my first point. The second point, I think, where further work ought to be done is, uh, uh, and maybe not, nothing that the CFTC can directly help with, uh, but something that's important, if these uh, non-US CCPs have access to US clients, uh, then, of course, the strong preference of these U.S. clients is also to to pledge uh, U.S. collateral, which often comes in the form of U.S. dollar cash. So the foreign CCPs, even if uh, fully registered as a BCO, today have no ability to place these funds in the most secure way, which would be in a Fed account. And that uh, is a route that's available to uh, many of the U.S. CCPs, but not to the foreign CCPs. And I think in terms of uh, systemic risk mitigation and stability of global markets, this would be something to consider uh, for the future. And uh, I think the CFTC has been uh, helpful in identifying this point. And again, it's something for the broader policy agenda, but important. Thank you very much, Mr. Mueller. Does anybody else have any uh, final questions or comments before we move on in our agenda? Uh, yes, this is John Orkin from uh, the London Stock Exchange Group. Could I uh, add a comment? Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Orkin. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So th thank you for uh, organizing today and Commissioner Stump for leading uh, the GMAC and all the commissioners in the CFTC for really your guidance and your support and certainly what I think all can know is an uh, unprecedented year. Um, as a, uh, a clearinghouse that is registered directly in multiple jurisdictions globally, uh, I want to first applaud the CFTC and the EU um, on their cross-border cooperation. Um, I think it's critical. We think it's critical. Um, and the principles uh, that we think are, uh, should be supported are uh, one of deference, reciprocity, and open access. Um, and we think the goal of all those should be uh, you know, safe and efficient markets uh, and, importantly, a level playing field uh, across all jurisdictions uh, for, for people to, to participate in um, and ensure the safe functions of the markets. So um, I just wanted to add that comment from, uh, from a clearinghouse that is, uh, uh, is directly registered in multiple jurisdictions, and, and it's important that uh, regulatory uh, cooperation uh, continues uh, uh, to help the markets perform, uh, perform well. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Horkins. Before we move on to the next item on our agenda, I'm going to turn it back over to Andre to do an update and the roll call. Thanks, Angie. I um, just wanted to note uh, several GMAC members who are present and on the call, um, but whom we could not hear during the original roll call. Uh, so present on the call are Ted Backer from Morgan Stanley, Clive Christensen, VP, Joe Suzuki, Better Markets, Jim Colby, Coalition for Derivatives and Users, Jerry Corcoran, R.J. O'Brien and Associates, Daniil Coutinho, CME Clearing, Adam Kanzler, IHS Market, Agnes Co, Singapore Exchange Limited, Murray Posmanter, DTCC, and Shane Twiggs, Cargo Risk Management. Thanks, Angie. Go ahead. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the second agenda item for this morning, which is a series of presentations on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on global clearing. We will start with a presentation from Nick Rustad, Chairman of the FIA Board of Directors. Please go ahead, Mr. Rustad. Hello, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Excellent, thank you. 
And thank you, Commissioner Stump, for the opportunity to speak today and to the other commissioners and GMAC members for their attendance. For those who do not know me, my name is Nick Rastad and I'm Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Futures Industry Association. But I'm also Head of JP Morgan's Derivatives Clearing Business. If we could move on to the first slide, please. At the end of October, the FIA uh, issued a paper providing a clearing member view of the March volatility in clearing. I'll be summarizing much of that paper in my remarks today. The review was global and not targeted at any one jurisdiction. Not all CCPs had the same issues, and some already have in place some of the recommendations it made. In March, we saw historic volatility, outpacing even the volatility seen during the 2008 crisis. The good news is that the clear derivatives market withstood the shock. In fact, central clearing and other post-crisis reforms helped ensure mitigation of credit risk and improved counterparty risk management. CCPs remain generally resilient, both from an operational and technological perspective. But March did provide a real-world stress test and allow us to see if there's any room for improvement. In our opinion, there is. The crisis exposed significant unintended consequences in some CCP's initial margin models, particularly for exchange-traded derivatives. They can be summarized into three areas. The pro-cyclicality of CCP margin requirements contributed to the overall level of stress in financial markets. The steep and rapid increases in CCP initial margin requirements created funding pressures on FCMs and their clients. And unscheduled intraday margin calls are hard to predict and sometimes not transparent, making it hard to plan for in advance. A number of regulators and global standard setting bodies have issued reports on the March volatility, which touch on this subject. Most recently, the FSB put out a report on the March market turmoil, which noted that regulators will undertake further work on margin frameworks in 2021, which we welcome and we look forward to engaging on. We hope the FIA's work can contribute to these efforts. I thought it'd be helpful to start with a quick review of what happened during the spring volatility. FIA used data from CPIM IOSCO's quarterly publicly quantitative disclosures from nine CCPs to estimate the impact. Four were based in the US, four in Europe, and one in Japan. These nine CCPs collectively clear a wide range of contracts in both OTC and ETD markets across interest rates, equities, foreign exchange, credit, and commodities. The aggregate amount of initial margin of these nine CCPs rose from 563 billion at year end to 833 billion at the end of the first quarter. This data is only reported quarterly, but that's a 48% jump in margin during the first three months of 2020. Next slide, please. This data is uh, presented graphically on this slide. You can easily see the jump in initial margin at the end of Q1. A quick note on the data, the time series begins in 2015 because this is when the CCPs began publishing this data. We do not have comparable data from the global financial crisis of 2008. Next slide, please. This chart is based on the same data as the previous slide, but we've presented the data in a different way so that you can see the variations across CCPs. The chart shows the total level of initial margin for the three most recent quarters available. Taking a more granular view shows that the increase in initial margin levels varied across CCPs, which reflects the differences in asset classes, contract types, and margin models. Next slide, please. This chart is based on data published monthly by the CFTC on the total amount of customer funds held in futures accounts at futures commission merchants regulated by the CFTC. As the chart shows, the amount of customer funds hit a record in March 2020. In fact, the increase in that one month was more than $100 billion. That increase was the single largest month increase in the history of this data and exceeded even the increase in customer funds during the financial crisis of 2008. The size of this increase shows the pressure on customers to locate a large amount of additional collateral and deposit with their FCMs and to do so in an unusually short period of time. Just a quick note on this data, the amount shown here the required segregated funds as defined by the CFTC and do not include excess deposits from the SCMs. Next slide, please. A common question is whether this increase in margin held at CCPs is caused by an increase in client positions or open interest, or by the scale of increase in the individual contract levels of margin. Based on the information we have available, I would argue that it's likely to be the latter. 
by seven shows monthly aggregate open interest and the increases in positions is barely noticeable on this chart in the way that it was on the previous charts showing margin. In fact, positions and open interest remain fairly constant through the first half of the year. Next slide, please. In my opening statement, I highlighted the FIA review was global and the next few slides will show this issue is not limited to a single jurisdiction, CCP or asset class. Let's start with the equity indices of the three benchmark contracts in the US, Europe and Japan. The S&P, the level of margin almost doubled from $6,600 a contract to $12,000 a contract. The euro stocks 50, it did more than double. However, this does not tell the full story. What these numbers disguise is that the value of a contract is falling at the same time. If you want to look at margin as a percentage of the value of the contract, the S&P went from 3.9% to almost 11%. The euro stocks 50 went from 6.9% to almost 20% of notional. If we scan through the next couple of slides, you'll see that this is not just limited to equity. The next few charts show similar trends in fixed income and in commodities to where CCPs needed to adjust margin models to reflect the possibility that the price of oil could, and did, go negative. Next slide, please. So why do individual contract margin rates and by extension, the aggregate amount of margin held have to increase at the rate it did. Quite simply, it's because the levels of margin set were inadequate for the market environment we found ourselves in. This slide shows the numbers of futures contracts where the daily move exceeded the margin held against that contract. To use the example of the S&P 500 contract earlier, if the margin was 3.9%, then we are classifying a breach as a one-day move greater than 3.9%. You can see how the number of margin breaches reported by the nine major clearing houses rose from 3,106 during the 12 months ending in Q4 to 6,640 in the 12 months ending Q1 2020. In other words, the number of margin breaches that occurred in Q1 alone was greater than for the total for the 12 preceding months. This is one of the reasons why we refer to the first half of 2020 as a stress test of the clearing system. When there are shortfalls in initial margin, the first line of defense has been breached. If a client cannot meet the resulting margin call within a short period of time, we begin moving through the waterfall of the default management process. Each clearing member is responsible for the risk they bring, but that does not diminish the need to ensure that appropriate levels of margin set for the industry as a whole are appropriate. Clearing members manage the risk client by client. Clearing houses manage the risk of the broader market. It is very important to note that margin models are not designed and should not be designed to cover all market movements in all market scenarios. Margins are calculated at a 99% confidence interval. In plain English, that means we should expect two to three margin breaches per contract per year. Of course, there are more breaches than that during March. Before I finish this review of what happened and move on to suggestions for improvement, it is worth reflecting on one more thing. All the examples I've given refer to listed derivatives. I've barely mentioned how OTC margin models behaved in this period. This is because breaches were larger and more frequent for exchange traded derivative contracts relative to over to the counter contracts. And for CP CCPs with lower margin periods of risk, with lower confidence levels, but control pro cyclicality by capping margin increases and that clear less liquid contracts. The five-day regulatory minimum mempool for OTC contracts mean that OTC margins remained more stable. In contrast, exchange-traded derivative margins started from a lower base, with hence they were subject to a higher and more procyclical margin increase under the stress conditions. The next two slides try to reflect this graphically by showing the upper and lower boundaries of margin for an OTC derivative and its equivalent listed derivative contract, in this case a 10-year interest rate swap and a 10-year US Treasury bond future. Both happen to have margin set by the same clearinghouse. Our purpose is to show how the differences in how margin models treat OTC and ETD to the products that present very similar levels of risk. We move on to the next slide for the bond future. The green line at the top and the dark gray line at the bottom are mirror images of each other. We include both in our analysis to show the maximum coverage for both losses and gains. The scatter plot in the middle shows the mark-to-market change in contract value on a daily basis from mid-February to mid-December. As you can see, on the US Treasury futures chart, there are several blue dots outside the boundaries of margin coverage. These are margin breaches that took place in February and March. You can also see the adjusted margin was 
so you also see the move in adjusted margin requirement was very rapid during that period and continues to keep the requirements at a relatively higher level than at the start of the year. If we flick back to the same analysis for the 10-year interest rate swaps, you can see the initial margin requirement was much higher relative to daily p and and there were no margin breaches. It is clear that the amount of margin required <coughs> for over-the-counter interest rate swaps is much higher than ETB. One reason is the difference in the margin period of risk. For OTC, it's generally five days compared to two days, one to two days for exchange trade derivatives. This is only one example, but having a look at recalibration of margin models is one option to look at. By 14, <coughs> which I'll skip over in the interest of time, by one more operator, thank you, uh, shows this across a number of contracts. Uh, but as I say, I'll, I'll move on for margin of time. If we move on to slide 15, thank you. Initial margin undoubtedly should have risen during this period of time, and the FIA is not, go, is not arguing at all about this. DCPs must increase margin to cover a risk. However, we do believe the level of margin increases during the spring volatility was too great, and therefore margin either started too low or ended up too high. One solution to these steep increases in margin could be by setting appropriate floors so margin doesn't fall too low during quieter times. Not all flows, floors operate the same, and we believe this situation calls for a review of floor methodologies to see if they are robust or could be strengthened. Next slide, please. Of course, we understand that margin is not intended to cover 100% of the risk, so a balance must be struck in setting the floors. I've just discussed how different products and jurisdictions have different standards for margin periods of risk and confidence levels. We recommend a principles-based approach. Look-back periods should be long enough to include a variety of market environments and always include periods of significant market stress. Floors should be calibrated for specific contracts and asset classes. Margins should be calibrated based on an analysis of absolute and percentage returns in order to set floors that are both adequate in low and high price regimes. We acknowledge this could lead to an increase in the level of margin and funding during BAU market conditions and recognize that there is a balance to be struck to ensure that incentives to clear are not diminished. But arguably, these costs exist today and are currently covered through large default funds, which coincidentally saw a decrease as margin levels increased during the crisis. Incentives to clear already exist in part to the levels of margin required under the uncleared margin rules brought in post-2008. Next slide, please. We also strongly recommend that margin frameworks must be back-tested to test the potential for large and sudden increases in margin requirements. This testing would be in addition to the back-testing of margin sufficiency that is done now. This means defining a maximum rate of change over a predefined period of time and then testing whether a stress test would cause the margin to exceed those defined parameters. If it does, the margin framework should be adjusted. The, frame Next slide. the framework for intraday calls should also be revisited. Margin which is collected in today can be both initial margin and variation margin, but it tends to typically be their raw variation margin. DCPs must be able to call for additional funds in today to maintain sufficient capital collateral. However, it's important to note that intraday calls can increase funding pressures and therefore clearing members keep buffers for funding needs in today. DCP requests funding within 60 minutes, and clearing members usually fund those without immediately requesting that collateral from clients. In many cases, clients are based on the opposite side of the world, and this would be highly impractical. At some point during the spring volatility, members were called more than six times for intraday margin. For OTC derivatives, any intraday margin calls require the clearing member to run a residual interest calculation before we can release funds to the clearing house. This is a tight turnaround time. Although CCPs can share high-level details around their IM methodologies, there is not full transparency. FCMs cannot replicate IM moves with precision, so the transparency is at best described as partial. FCMs can only approximate funding requirements. Some CCPs use ad hoc calls more routinely, but they should only be used during severe, mar severe market moves. CCPs call for intraday losses but do not pay out gains, creating liquidity stress. This variation margin is particularly a challenge if a market were to reverse intraday as you get no benefit for the margin that has already been posted. Variation margin should be zero sum across the system and therefore should not impact overall market liquidity. However, the practice of some CCPs of not paying out intraday gains whilst calling for losses invalidates this construct and adds strain to the system at precisely the time unnecessary strain is most unwanted. 
Some calls are required to be met in cash and come late in the day. Regulatory requirements around holding excess and bank diversification rules means it is hard to pull funds back from safe sources. Some CCPs do not allow intraday funding to be applied against an end-of-day requirement, resulting in further double funding. Failure to recognise end-of-day amounts that have essentially been prepaid seems a technical oversight that can be easily addressed and would help alleviate unnecessary strain in the system. Last slide, please. Therefore, we offer some specific solutions to these issues. We recommend the following best practices around intraday calls, including routine intraday calls to be made at the same time every day. This would be easier operationally for what is currently a very manual process. Calls should clearly separate initial margin and variation margin. This would allow clearing members to cover intraday initial margin calls with non-cash collateral. Ad hoc intraday calls should be used on a, on a limited basis, perhaps once a clearing member specific threshold has been exceeded. And CCP should provide full transparency of triggers for calls. In conclusion, we look forward to dialogue such as this one with Commissioner Stump and equivalent meetings such as the one we organised today. We look forward to discussing what should be best practices around CCP margin to lessen pro-cyclical impacts going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rusta. The second presentation will be from Sean Downey, Executive Director of Clearing, Risk and Capital Policy at CME Group. Please go ahead, Mr. Downey. Thank you, and I just want to confirm that you can hear me? We can, thank you. Great, so first I wanted to thank the commissioners and CFTC staff in particular Commissioner Stump for hosting this event and um, Andre Goldsmith for coordinating the meeting. I know this has been a difficult year for everyone. I'm honored to have the chance to present on this important topic. So before I get into the slides, I just wanted to make three quick points uh, on some views on the overall year that we had. So first I'd like to say that um, CME Clearing certainly agrees with uh, the notion that Central Clearing performed very well during the COVID pandemic stress, just as it has historically during past stress. Also, I wanted to note, when you think about anti-procyclicality of CCP margins, the goal of anti-procyclical measures is to mitigate the size and the speed of increases in margin in response to changing market conditions, with the goal being to avoid causing or exacerbating financial instability. Based on this, uh, we are going to focus the majority, although not exclusively, on the aggregate margin changes and our portfolio coverage levels throughout this time period. Mm -hmm. Finally, I just want to note that, and this has been noted in the past, but uh, this was a once in a century pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. I think most of us uh, on, who are on this call probably didn't experience the 1918 um, Spanish flu. So it is uh, quite an event. Uh, in which the vast majority of the world economy shut down and based on World Bank estimates, the global economy suffered the largest GDP decline since at least World War II. So now just moving on to the first slide. Uh, this just gives a little bit of context on the moves that we saw in our markets um, at a product level uh, to reinforce the severity of what happened. Uh, as you can see, uh, Treasury yields uh, suffered their largest daily percent shifts ever. Uh, on the equity front, the nine largest dollar moves in the history of the S&P 500, the 10 largest in the Dow, and the seven largest in the NASDAQ occurred in March and April 2020. And finally, uh, crude oil saw the two largest dollar percentage price moves ever. So we think that's important in context as we continue to discuss the response of CCPs to the COVID pandemic and the stress that's associated. Moving on to the next slide, please. Despite this historic volatility, uh, CME clearing, and obviously I'm going to be focusing on CME clearing, um, did not make any changes to its BAU approach to managing risk. Very importantly, one of the things that CME did not change is the fact that any time we made an increase to margins, we gave uh, our members and the market at least 24 hours notice before those increases became effective. Now, what that allows uh, participants to do is to rebalance their portfolio if they see fit in, resp in response to the margin changes and gives them the chance to um, take actions as necessary uh, to address any funding requirements that they might have. 
Also, just wanting to note that there were no ad hoc margin cycles run by CME throughout this time. As many of you likely know, CME collects and pays out um, variation margin twice a day for its um, base offering, so its, uh, its um, exchange-traded derivative offering, and once a day for interest rate swaps. And on initial margin front, we collect initial margin twice a day for exchange-traded derivatives and once a day for interest rate swaps. Now, a couple of important points here, uh, and one in particular, is that if you compare, and we'll see more of this on the next slide, the variation flow to the initial margin adjustments, you'll see that the price volatility significantly exceeded any margin changes. And I would also note that from a portfolio coverage perspective, we covered 99.97% in base and 99.87% in IRS, which significantly exceeds um, the regulatory expectations. Moving to the next slide. So what this shows is throughout the March and April time period, which are the two, which is the most volatile two months of this entire um, stress, the average day-over-day -day margin change and the maximum day-over-day -day margin change as compared to margin on deposit. As you will see, it's approximately 1% on average and 6.47% or approximately 6.5% uh, at a max level. So while there has been some discussion about the size of margin increases over longer time frames, it's important to note that on a day-over-day -day basis, the margin increases were relatively mitigated both from a match perspective and on average. Moving on to the next slide, please. And this is an important comparison. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions here about the level of stress and the level of price moves that were observed during uh, the COVID pandemic. And what this compares is the max mark-to-market or variation flow in a single day to the max initial margin change with uh, one explanatory note that we're actually showing the initial margin at least for exchange-traded derivatives on a net basis. Now, the reason we do that is variation is paid and collected on a net basis, whereas customer gross margin has been collected in the U.S. since, I believe, 2012 uh, for both exchange-traded derivatives and swaps. So in order to have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, we are removing the impact of gross margin on a customer level uh, for exchange-traded derivatives in this comparison. And so what you see is that effectively the price moves, which are reflected by variation, are, are almost three times as great as the maximum initial margin change. And so what that demonstrates is that the goal of having anti-procyclical margins that will mitigate margin increases is accomplished by the fact that almost two-thirds of the price move uh, is not needed to be addressed in initial margin changes. So we think this is an important slide to demonstrate the difference between the price moves and the initial margin changes uh, at CME Clearing. Next slide, please. Now, this, uh, I think, has taken on a bit more importance as we discuss uh, the implications of open interest for margin changes at TCPs. I know that in the previous presentation, there was a discussion about the fact that open interest did not materially change. I think what's important to point out on this slide is in particular the E-mini S&P. Uh, that is consistently uh, representing the largest margin for any single product uh, at CME Clearing. And in that case, the open interest increased by 32% from the end of January to uh, the end of March. Now, this 32% change resulted in approximately $68 billion in initial margin for the E-mini S&P. So while the overall increase in open interest is a little over 8%, so still an increase, the E-mini, which is by far the largest uh, contract from a margin on deposit perspective, increased 32%, which effectively means that a significant portion of the margin increase, or at least a material portion, was driven by an increase in open interest. You can also see that a significant increase in open interest occurred in the WTI contract as well. So just to clarify, 
those contracts that represent large portions of initial margin on deposit, in particular the S&P, did uh, have a significant increase in open interest between the end of December 2019 and the end of March 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just the slide, and I'll, I'll cover this relatively quickly, but I just wanted to note that um, we at CME Clearing do compare uh, the anti-procyclicality of our margins to some of the global standards for anti-procyclicality. Uh, and as you can see, the, the one-day and 30-day increase in initial margins at CME were lower than the increases using one of the standardized tools for um, anti-procyclicality and margins. So we do believe that targeted anti-procyclical measures are important in CCP risk management. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next four slides, and I'm going to go through them relatively quickly, uh, are using the same unit of measure and comparing the price changes in four different products to the initial margin changes. Uh, and as you can see, there was repeated stress, significant price changes, and relative to the changes in initial margin, um, they were significant and very much uh, larger than those initial margin changes. So go on to the next slide. So you see the same thing here, uh, larger price moves and initial margin changes by an order of magnitude. Next slide. Same thing here, uh, same theme. I will not spend too much time. Uh, next slide, please. And again, on COMEX Gold, uh, the same theme here that uh, the price changes uh, dwarfed the changes in initial margin. So now moving on to the next slide, please. So um, we provided this slide because there has been some discussion um, you know, at a general level uh, about the implications of um, clearing on um, overall funding in other markets and uh, what actions were taken by participants in response. And so this is demonstrating the excess margin on deposit at CME. And as you can see, there was uh, a drawdown of that excess margin on deposit, which we would expect uh, during such an environment. But it very quickly returned to previous levels. So while there was uh, a short and relatively sharp uh, drawdown, uh, the excess margin did not take long to return to the 6 to 7 percent average that we had seen prior to uh, the COVID stress. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. This is a very important slide, I think, from our perspective. Um, in particular, we've seen lots of discussion about dash for cash, and a lot of policymakers considered uh, the implications of the dash for cash on a variety of the financial variety of markets within the financial system. And so this is obviously only what we've observed at CME Clearing, but from our perspective and the data that we have, uh, we actually saw a significant increase in cash at CME Clearing, and to note, much more significant than any increase in margins. Uh, margins went from approximately 145 to 150 billion, so around 250 billion at the peak, uh, in contrast, the cash we have on deposit went from the high 20 billion range to over 90 billion, so it more than tripled, and uh, that has maintained throughout the period. So one of the points I think of um, that we wanted to make here is that at least from the data that we have and what we've observed in our market, there has not been a dash for cash, and it's important to note that the clearing members could have met. Um, their obligations in U.S. Treasuries uh, very easily if they needed cash for other purposes. We don't have any cash minimums. I know that some CCPs do, but to be very clear, we don't. So the, the inclusion of this cash or the deposit of this cash with CME clearing is very much voluntary in nature, and it could have been substituted for other collateral types, in particular U.S. Treasuries. So uh, I think that is the last slide in the presentation. Uh, and so with that, I will give up my time, wish everyone happy holidays, and thank everyone again for the opportunity to present and cover on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Downey. The third presentation will be from Dimitri Senko, Chief Risk Officer and member of the Executive Board at UREX Clearing. Please go ahead, Mr. Senko. Hello. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. 
But thank you very much for the possibility to contribute today. And uh, I will uh, present some facts and figures how Eurex Clearing went through the uh, crisis this year, but also uh, will provide some perspective of Eurex Clearing on the industry discussion uh, that we also have today. So if you can move to the next slide, please. Actually, the next one. Next. So our thinking, yeah, yeah, I think let's start with this one. Our thinking is that uh, 2020 was an important year where the financial architecture, which was designed and uh, has been implemented since 2009, uh, was put into a big test, and it's worth looking into how it behaved throughout the crisis. So again, the key logic of central clearing is if it's stripped down to very few bullets, it's about collateralizing of exposures. And if we follow uh, now this logic, collateralizing exposures, what could change there over time? The, the collateral which is required is in a way a function of uh, what happens with portfolio, what happens uh, on the market as market regime changes, and, and what, what happens with the uh, risk parameters that are used to quantify exposures. And all these three drivers, uh, we observed the changes, um, understandably, due to the happening on the market. Uh, but let's keep it in mind, collateralization of exposure is essential uh, in the logic of clearing house. Let's go to the next slide, please. That's the next one. So uh, that's uh, the chart on the intraday margin calls that were performed in the months uh, during the crisis and uh, some months before and some months up after, both in, in the number of margin calls was um, hi higher, much higher than usual, and uh, the amount that were collected were much higher. And uh, this is um, related to the situation that market moves were uh, pretty large back in the days. We have seen now a few presentations on that one. and. Um, um, currently, as we see, and, and it continues like that, intraday margin calls are back to normal levels. That's one piece on um, on how tricks clearing performed through the crisis. Now, next slide, and uh, yeah, the next one, please. More facts and figures. That's the view on the total margins that over time that your clearing collected. And here we see before the crisis, we've been at the levels of around 60 billion. And um, into the crisis, uh, the margin, the total margins collected peaked at around 110 billion, so almost doubled. And since then, it is gradually declining, uh, consistent with the observation that volatility regime is getting back to normal, not completely back to pre-crisis levels. We have seen, for example, a small spike uh, after the uh, U.S. presidential elections due to vaccine announcements that is visible here, so where volatility picked up a bit again. Uh, but overall, we are now at around 70 billion margins. If you look at the table below, you will see uh, the breakdown into cash, non-cash, and a uh, few metrics there. So when talking about the, um, it's important point when we later talk about intraday margin calls mechanics, we also accept non-cash, and it's pretty material portion and remained pretty stable throughout the crisis at around uh, almost 50-50, uh, so cash and non-cash. If you can move to the next slide, please. That's now a deep dive into a product level backtest. We have seen similar charts uh, before, so earlier today, that's our benchmark product, US Stocks 50 index product, and the chart outline, we, we see here margin levels, both for long and short term, uh, long and short contracts, margins with and without floors, and uh, the blue dots are the profit loss. Here, taking a three day view because our holding period, ma margin period of risk assumption is three days for this type of contracts. Here, we, we see at the beginning of the crisis, we started into the uh, crisis at the levels of around 7%. If I take the um, long contracts and uh, gradually it increased you know, first to 17, then to 20, and, and now it's gradually decreasing with, with some uh, increase again after the vaccine related news in November. So uh, the, most of the backtesting breaches were happening at the beginning of the crisis where uh, 
the margins were still low. And uh, yeah, so one is to, to observe how big is the breach. And another one, it's interesting and visible here, the margin reacts a few days afterwards by uh, yeah, increasing the levels of margins to adapt to the new level of volatility. This adaptation is done automatically in our model. So our model is a formula which has, takes as input the level of volatility and uh, basically uh, starting from there, it's, uh, there is no manual interactions, interventions. We haven't adapted any formula or any parameter within the formula throughout the crisis. So all what's happened, uh, yeah, happened uh, based on the predefined formula which was tested uh, before the crisis when we introduced you know, the, the model like a few years ago. Uh, the, the parameters are regularly recalibrated usually, but this, throughout this period we um, didn't have to adapt. So uh, now pausing here and talking about transparency and predictability, um, there are a few layers of predictability. One is uh, when the model is completely transparent, the formula is there, Understandably, we don't know what the market move will be, but if someone knows what is the market move, he can use the formula and calculate by himself uh, what would be the response of the margin. So that's uh, kind of the, the way we are approaching the margin modes, and that's to be seen in contrast maybe other margin models where it's uh, yeah the formula is not known uh, and, and uh, margin is adapted based yeah on, on some uh, less transparent criteria. Another point of note here. Floor and without floors, if we look um, at the beginning of the chart, these dotted lines are uh, the uh, what margin would have been without floors. So without floors, we would have started into the crisis at the level of <clears throat> four to five percent margins. With floors, we started into seven um, uh, with seven percent level roughly, and uh, yeah, that shows how um, kind of uh, uh, the floor helps to uh, the margin not to jump and not to triple quadruple not, not to quadruple but maybe uh, yeah to, to produce a change of only two and a half if it's looked at, at this time scale of several months okay uh, let's move to the next slide please and also yeah and next one so some reflection to the industry discussion now there are two views possible on what happened and they are interchangeably uh, mentioned or a mixture of those is mentioned in the papers that are being discussed. One uh, one alternative is to say it seems that CCP, CCPs and clearing industry worked as designed, as it was designed in 2009. Another way is uh, to to see, uh, yeah, to view it in a way with this important data set, and, and in general, it's a, a common sense to uh, to look at how things are being done, understand uh, the current state and potential limitations of the current state. And uh, yeah, think what could be improved. It's, it's a common sense of this continuous improvement thinking, and more so given that we have such a, an interesting year behind us, or still to, uh, within this year. And that's our approach. And uh, we are happy to participate in, in this discussion and also in the industry discussions going forward. Um, next slide, please. So our take on the discussion landscape is outlined here, and I will go through a few topics. If we start with the bottom part, we are on the margin model. All, all the uh, topics on margin models, we are pretty much aligned with FIA paper here on the floors. So we have stress period floors in place that go further than uh, 10 years back. So we still have to update crisis in there. Um, um, we have uh, you know, this formula-based approach, which is in terms of reactiveness it's, uh, and predictability is transparent. Now on reactiveness, if, if I talk in the discussion points that are uh, possible or needed, it, it's actually, uh, yeah, uh, the industry discussion should be there and, and agreement should be sought how quick or how slow margins should react in a way, in, in, a, in a typical model, it's, it's one factor, decay factor or half-life half -life parameter, which is usually used and yeah, there should be a consensus on how, how quickly it should react and starting from there. Um, it could be adapted. Uh, it has to be named now again, continuing with the trade-offs here that um, least procyclical model would be a flat uh, margin, which is in itself uh, 
uh, is a bad model as well or has bad properties as well, it usually, if, if the margin doesn't react to changes in market volatility, usually there are a lot of margin breaches or the margin is, should be set very high also throughout very uh, periods of uh, very calm markets. So I think consensus and uh, current thinking in, in, in modeling uh, of the margins or any you know, risk numbers is that, that there, there should be some level of you know, reactivity to the uh, to the increased volatility on the market. Um, if we go to margin period of risk, we we are again here pretty much aligned. Our margin period of risk setting is uh, educated by our default management process. So we we have four fixed income periods, two days period holding period for equity derivatives, three day periods and for OTC five day, and then the thinking is to have um, margin period of risk set to uh, be enough to be able to liquidate the portfolios. Um, in terms of trade-offs, I think yeah, this has to be looked at whether one day is sufficient or whether, and, and I think we are here in line with FIA paper that uh, this thinking of alignment between margin period of risk and default management is, uh, yeah, is the principle which should be applied. On backtesting, we have products and portfolio level backtests. Here, one uh, learning or white tra one trade-off that we noted in the industry discussion, it makes sense. Uh, to uh, to compare apples and apples and backtest you know, margins of different CCPs against uh, let's say same one day PNL um, because yeah, PNL is reality and, and margins are models so compare different models with the same reality we should uh, take really the same reality it doesn't make sense to backtest some uh, you know, CCPs against three day PNLs and some with one day PNL then the yeah, the outcomes are biased if we do that. So proposal is to have aligned um, backtesting piano. And uh, on concentration um, and liquidity, we have them built into the model. And uh, yeah, the question is, again, on the modalities, should it be really within the initial margin model, which is uh, updated intraday, or uh, yeah, there could be solutions where concentration add-ons are outside and then updated only. Yeah, once per day or less frequently. So there are yeah, design choices, uh, different design choices possible. So for IM uh, initial margin model, we are pretty much aligned. Uh, let me quickly run through the intraday margin code, which um, poses a broader uh, set of topics to discuss. So um, here it is important to uh, di differentiate into different drivers for intraday margin code, and three main drivers are uh, it's market moves or position change or margin features. We have seen also from few presentations today, it's most, well, uh, yeah, two hypotheses. I mean, position change, uh, everyone uh, who, who, who argued here, it was, it's not so big, but market moves is big and margin features, it was argued that it is big. I think it's not in our, in our, in our case. So we are not changing, we haven't changed margins intraday. It's, it's happening overnight. Uh, and uh, gradually uh, with this formula is discussed, but market moves are, you know, we, we think are the biggest ones. Um, now, in terms of timing of uh, the margin calls, it's, uh, there, there are two different possibilities. We have event-driven margin calls, meaning that we have a risk model in place which quantifies changes of exposures near, on a near real-time basis. So if there is any market move or any position change, the margin is calculated within uh, yeah, several seconds. And uh, then if shortfall, if collateralization situation is such that margin requirement is higher than collateral, then uh, it is an event for, uh, it is a case to issue the intraday margin call. There are operational thresholds in place, but still it's event driven. And the, the biggest design choice is here, uh, have batch driven scheduled uh, margin calls or uh, event-driven margin calls. Here, the clear trade-off is operational facilitation of you know, clear times and clear batches versus, um, you know, if the market move is happening between the batches, then uh, there is uncovered exposure at CCP, uh, which, yeah, which remains uncovered un until the next batch. Um, in terms of covering by non-cash, we, we allow uh, the intraday margin calls uh, to be covered by non-cash. So even if it's uh, driven by the change in price, 
uh, which on the other side pre prevents us from yeah, paying out cash to, let's say, uh, the losers and gainers from the market move. Uh, from those who are losing money, we can accept intraday non-cash, but this means we cannot pay out cash to the, those who are gaining. So uh, there is this asymmetry you know, driven by the situation that we allow non-cash intraday. And, and the, the, another design choice would be to really introduce uh, pay in, pay out during the day, uh, yeah, which which has to be evaluated, discussed. Uh, it, it has its own downsides with uh, operational burden of paying in, paying out several times a day in all the currencies um, that that are yeah being cleared in all the product currencies consistently. Um, I, I, and if this netting level uh, away, and uh, in terms of predictability. I think one uh, one, uh, one type uh, in terms of solution space, uh, there is a timing predictability, and an amount predictability remains remains uh, yeah, unknown because amount is usually yeah, we saw the biggest driver is market change and market uh, no one can predict. So, uh, but as a small yeah, improvement of of the operational. And transparency on the way reports are possible. We have the reports, uh, for example, every 10 minutes we produce the reports that outline uh, what is the collateralization situation, what, what is the margin, what is collateral. So based on these reports, it could be an early kind of signal or just an early warning and early uh, planning for what could happen uh, soon if the market uh, movements are happening. So yeah, I think that was uh, uh, good. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, and uh, on, on margin model again, I think uh, there is zone of potential agreement. Also from what I heard today, I think everyone had uh, now slides on back testing and how uh, how margins performed. Here is uh, our proposal that to to progress uh, in in any yeah, in any direction. The discussion first step would be a, a fact based analysis of the data set for 2020 where you know, all the CCPs uh, have the product level uh, margins and, and behavior and, and, and this can be held uh, and, and understood what is the uh, what are the backtesting metrics on top of it and the same data set informs also procyclicality metrics so two metrics also even uh, give insight into liquidity matters for example if we take this uh, maximum Rate of change of initial margin over one day. This gives uh, this gives us a, a number of what, 16 percent, 24 percent, similar numbers that we have seen on other slides today. So rate of change from one day to another, initial margin can change like 16 percent. Uh, now, if you look at another metric here in green box, it's loss to margin ratio. That's one day loss, worst loss divided by margin on the previous day. Uh, this goes as high as 103 for euro stocks. I take an example. This means that if you have initial margin of X, uh, you could have intraday margin call of you know 1.03 times X. So it could be uh, this size of yeah you know, variation margin call as uh, you know, as high as I M. Whereas uh, the increase of I M next day is only like 16 percent. Also here we see that uh, the biggest uh, the biggest thing for intraday margin calls are the, the market moves. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. And to the next one, I think we can skip because I covered. So in terms of the discussion going forward, if, if we look at this uh, different levels uh, where we are uh, discussing this, obviously we've been to, to the level of, or oh, I'm presenting the perspective of your experience, which is the box to the left bottom, one CP, and we see many CMs and we know how it's, uh, works out during the crisis. There is also of one CM connected to many CCPs and uh, serving many clients. But I think there are also higher levels of uh, clearing ecosystems with many CCPs, many clients, many clearing members, and there is also higher level of cleared and uncleared view. Uh, so, uh, and we evaluated few pain points, or few pain points are visible from the discussions until now. I think uh, we need to, knowing this, also press towards solution alternatives and um, intended target states, state based on what we learned and based on the outcomes of the discussions. But also, we should, I mean, in search of you know systemic uh, level solutions or to solve systemic uh, problems that uh, may be there, 
um, potentially could occur, we, we should be looking also into solutions on, on further on the higher levels um, and, and what is you know, what is visible kind of um, only improvements at one CCP will, will probably not uh, not help the, uh, to progress with solutions for the overall picture. Um, next slide, please. Mr. Senko, so just to let slide. you know, we're we're running a little uh, short on time, yeah. so uh, I just wanted to give you that heads up. Yeah, no, and that's the last slide. So I think um, our view is that in short term, there is, seems to be zone of agreement to have this uh, back testing, uh, the data based analysis of what should be the uh, the best trajectory of margins. And then starting from there, uh, the CCPs can try to approach this ideal target state. So that's purely this uh, data driven exercise based on margins, product level margins and PLs. And uh, in mid term, I think we are happy to contribute to the discussion if we want to find further uh, stronger solutions to kind of higher level problems at the systemic level. Thank you very much for the possibility to contribute today and uh, back to you, please. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Senko. Our final presentation will be from Sai Srinivasan, Deputy Director in the Risk Surveillance Branch of the CFCC's Division of Clearing and Risk. Mr. Srinivasan, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, it's still, uh, good morning uh, from Washington, D.C. Uh, and at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Commissioner Stump and the GMAC for inviting us to present uh, today's meeting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, more specifically, uh, I want to add a few more sort of clarifications. Um, I, I, as you see from the presentations by the previous presenters, there was a sort of a diversity of views on uh, some very interesting aspects of uh, how the system worked. Um, the uh, sort of the material I'm going to be presenting today uh, will touch on uh, all those themes, uh, but I'd just like to clarify that. Uh, you know, we at CFTC, the staff are, you know, still sort of going through the analysis, um, and uh, you know, we really haven't arrived at any conclusions. Uh, so, you know, we might be asking some, uh, you know, provoking questions, but it's sort of just to sort of uh, get us engaged in uh, identifying the correct issues. So, I just thought I should uh, make that explicit. Uh, second, uh, you know, we'd like to. Uh, I'm still on uh, the previous slide. Uh, second, uh, you know. Just in terms of looking back at uh, 2020, I would really like to thank our colleagues in the uh, newly named uh, Market Partisans Division. Uh, we work very closely with them, uh, and we did that through March and April and sort of continue to work with them. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, the DCOs, uh, the FCMs, and other market participants. Uh, we keep bugging them for lots of information, uh, and we really appreciate the, the support and uh, collaboration. Uh, and finally, uh, from a regulatory perspective, while CFTC has been spending a fair amount of time uh, studying and analyzing and understanding what happened in the markets and how things function, we've also been spending a lot of time with uh, uh, our other regulators, both in the U.S. Uh, and internationally, uh, you know, daily, weekly, uh, uh, and sort of regular calls multiple times a day, and that's been a pretty important part of uh, uh, you know, what we've been doing this year. Uh, next slide. Uh, so these are sort of the uh, the themes I'm going to be covering of uh, essentially the same ones that uh, the other presenters uh, had done. So I wouldn't spend much time on this. Uh, next slide. Uh, sort of the shameless marketing for the the risk surveillance branch. Uh, it might be one of the well kept kept secrets at uh, the CFTC. Uh, so sort of functionally, we are responsible for three things. Uh, you know, one is uh, margin model oversight. A lot of discussions of margin models uh, and the performance. So that's uh, we have a group that's dedicated to uh, studying margin models, doing quantitative assessment for margin models. So this stuff is pretty close to what we do on a daily basis. Uh, the commission is uh, you know, we receive receive a very rich set of uh, highly granular reports daily from uh, the DCOs and SCMs. And over the years, we've invested a fair amount of effort to develop this quantitative uh, daily risk surveillance program where we can do pretty granular analysis of the product level, account, the portfolio level, and sort of firm entity level, both for FNO and for swaps. Uh, 
Uh, and then finally, we do care about uh, the CCB resilience and systemic risk issues, but from a very sort of quantitative perspective, and you see that through our supervisory stress tests. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a picture that uh, uh, others, uh, uh, similar representation that others have showed. Um, and uh, you know, this just basically shows uh, the, the initial margin, which was posted by uh, with the CCPs uh, during uh, 2020. Uh, the, uh, the the dark line, the blue line, basically shows the uh, sort of the rate at which uh, the IM selected uh, uh, was changing. And you can see there was a nice spike that occurred in in March, and uh, sort of slowly trending downwards as uh, volatility has subsided a little bit. Next slide. Uh, this is once again a uh, similar chart, uh, like as others have uh, have, have, have shown. Um, you know, we had the pandemic, and there was a huge increase uh, in both IM and VM. Uh, and uh, just one thing I like to point out is there could be days when uh, the CCPs would have returned some um, uh, IM to some market participants. Uh, what we capture here is just the uh, sort of the, the positive flows. Next slide. Uh, uh, once again, others have, uh, have pointed this out. Uh, you know, margin models are not supposed to cover uh, all, the, uh, all the moves uh, and some of the shocks that we saw in, uh, in March and April. They were clearly, you know, beyond the 99.7 or 99.8 coverage that many CCPs uh, target. Uh, so, um, you know, we have to we, uh, sort of uh, the, the job we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, we keep reminding ourselves that you know IM is meant to help the CCP cover the cost of liquidating a defaulting member's portfolio. In that sense, it has to sort of a very precise functional purpose. Uh, and so, the, the more important question, as others have been discussing, in for us is that uh, how well did the market, uh, did the models function, and whether the models reacted appropriately. Next, next slide. Uh, uh, Nick and others have, uh, you know, uh, spoken about this. Uh, so we do track uh, product level breaches. Uh, we find them interesting. And apologies for uh, the very busy slide. Uh, the the picture on the top just is our way of tracking, uh, you know, product level breaches, and we're able to size it by the size of the IM, so that we're focusing on the more, uh, you know, uh, important uh, contracts. Uh, the uh, the one the picture in the bottom picture just is our attempt at trying to put a dollar value on the size of the breaches uh, and what we see is uh, as you go about doing a business and you know tracking uh, all this activity and performance at account level and so on and so forth we are acutely aware of the fact that products do not default and we find the discussion that product level breach is very interesting as I said. But we are also very conscious of the fact that products that did not default, firms are the ones who have the potential of defaulting. So that raises the question as to what sort of account level breaches uh, we have seen. Uh, the CPMI uh, public disclosure, uh, uh, the quantitative disclosures by the uh, CCPs uh, present some information in the public domain. But what we see from the regulatory data is that, yes, there were account level breaches, but they were pretty small in number. That's the first point. Second is as we sort of dig deeper into the, uh, the, 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 the constitution of the portfolios of those, of, of those accounts, uh, they tend to be smaller accounts. Uh, and uh, pretty with uh, less diversified you know, directional holdings. Uh, and we are able to sort of aggregate uh, the positions across uh, or the, you know, the liabilities across all these accounts and make an assessment of you know, whether there was any risk to the clearing member or to the CCP. And we felt comfortable that uh, you know, we never got to the point where there was any concern. So, uh, but you know, it's, it's, uh, we keep reminding ourselves that you know, while product stuff is in, in important, uh, what really matters is what's happening in the account level. I'll sort of segue to uh, next slide, please. Uh, to a, a couple of uh, sort of macro-ish type questions and similar to uh, what others have been talking about here and want to provide some uh, uh, illustration of you know, where we are in some of our analysis and you know, some initial findings. Uh, so the first question, I'm just going to touch on two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, were CCP's margin models you know, too reactive to the shock uh, and hence uh, 
not appropriately anti-prostituted. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is what we what we have here is uh, this is for interest rate swaps across the uh, three DCOs who cover these uh, instruments, uh, and we are tracking activity at client level, not house, but just client level. Uh, we have three, uh, and this shows activity from Feb of 2020 till uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the blue line shows daily aggregate IM for these accounts, and it's indexed to 100. So basically, we set it at 100 for uh, for the values of Feb 2020. The red line shows uh, a daily aggregated gross notional size of these accounts. Uh, in the context of FNO, there was a discussion of what is happening in the context of open interest, um, and you know, trying to do a similar tracking about what is happening to uh, position changes. Uh, and this is also an indexed uh, number. Uh, the green line is a sort of a standard measure of risk in interest rate swap markets. It sort of measures the TVO one of these portfolios. Uh, in other words, the dollar value of uh, one basis point change in interest rates. So we know that uh, changes in IM that's collected by, CM, by the CCPs are driven by broadly two factors. One, position changes. Uh, there's record activity that's happening in the market, and there's some interesting discussion by the previous panelists uh, uh, on you know, what is happening in different markets. Uh, and the red line attempts to sort of capture the sort of position change factor. And the second is uh, you know, uh, the CCPs models uh, reactions to uh, volatility. Now, if you look at the aggregate numbers, one could read certain patterns in the data. Uh, so fortunately, we have access to more granular data, and so we have been looking very carefully at uh, disaggregated data. Uh, but you know, we have seen some discussions uh, uh, in the public domain of people sort of trying to draw conclusions uh, by just looking at aggregate data. So we've sort of been digging deeper, and if you go to the next slide, please. So what we've done here is, this is for interest rate swaps again, and we have sort of disaggregated the, uh, those, uh, those three time series uh, variables across uh, you know, different categories of market participants. We have asset managers, insurance companies, hedge funds, and banks. And when I say banks, these are banks that will come in as clients uh, um, of uh, clearing members or FCMs. So as we uh, dig deeper into this, what we observe is that there's a fair amount of heterogeneity in IM flows. We do see IM increasing uh, across all these different uh, types of market participants, but the position changes are very different across these, uh, these firms. Uh, and also, you know, the, the risk behavior uh, at, 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 within each group of these firms is uh, it's very different. Uh, so clearly, you know, portfolio composition uh, matters. Um, and uh, next slide. We do the same thing for uh, CDS, and we're in the process of doing something similar for FNO also. Uh, here, instead of uh, gross notional, we are tracking net notional. That's the only difference. And then instead of DVO1, we're, uh, we're tracking the dollar value of a basis point change in the credit spread. So uh, as you can see, uh, at least based on the data we have, uh, there was some interesting drop in uh, activity in sort of open interest if you measure it through uh, sort of the net notional. Uh, next slide. Uh, as we disaggregate it, uh, once again, we see uh, a fair amount of uh, heterogeneity among the different groups of market participants. In some sense, this is more drastic than what we see for interest rate swaps. And as we all know, there was a fair amount of uh, uh, volatility in the credit markets. In some sense, we, we could argue that they were more volatile than what we saw in the interest rate market also. So uh, we're continuing to do further analysis, uh, but I just want to give folks a flavor for, you know, as we get deeper and deeper into the data, uh, some of the patterns one might see and some of the conclusions you might find by just looking at aggregate data, uh, they start breaking down. So um, yeah, more analysis to be done, and uh, we anticipate we'll be busy uh, conducting that analysis through 2021. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this will be my, my, my final slide, and the second sort of uh, macroish question that we have been uh, uh, interested in 
is, and others have spoken about it, which is uh, did margin calls cause stress in the funding markets uh, and stress among market participants? Uh, what we are engaged in right now is, uh, uh, you know, trying to get uh, conduct you know, empirical database analysis uh, to collect evidence of what actually was happening. Uh, we are really interested in understanding the impact on the broader system, on clients, on members, um, uh, because in, in some sense you can say that you know the, the whole idea of APC is to sort of balance the interests of uh, CCP resilience with uh, uh, the broader market functioning. Uh, and one challenge we are facing that we keep running into is what we call the denominator problem. Uh, as we have seen, we have uh, you know incredible access to IM and VM flow data at the granular level for the cleared markets. Uh, the bigger challenge is getting access to data uh, to assess the relative size of these flows uh, relative to the other liquidity demands that you know clients were facing, intermediaries, and the broader financial system. Uh, so we are engaged in uh, you know, uh, working with market participants to you know collect more data. Uh, and conduct the analysis so that we can sort of look at these things more holistically. Uh, we, once again, this is going to keep us busy through 2021, uh, and uh, we look forward to coming back to the GMAC and its members and uh, providing you all an update. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Srinivasan. Commissioner Berkowitz, do you have a question for our panel? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, all the panelists, for very uh, interesting uh, presentation, presentations uh, and perspectives. And, and one, one um, uh, fact in the, in the presentation that really struck me was, was in the CME presentation um, uh, talking about the, the, the relative percentage change um, in open interest and um, where the significant um, change in open interest, most significant uh, were on the E-mini S&P and WPI, a 32% change in E-mini S&P and almost 30% change in WTI. And the initial margin requirements that CME is presenting on, on that page show that equities and E-mini S&P have, have the most significant or the largest initial margin requirements. I'm aware anecdotally um, that one of the one thing that happened, and I think this is we, we saw this in WTI, um, but anecdotally, what, what I've been hearing is uh, around this time there was a significant increase in retail participants, some people sitting at home at their computer, uh, people thinking the market's crashing, a lot of retail people um, jumping in the market. We had a number of brokerages unable to handle the retail volume. So uh, I guess the question would be, to what extent are these, uh, uh, a lot of the increase in open interest and then the resulting margin, increased margin requirements due to new market entrants due to retail participants? And I guess the answer to that may affect um, the, the, um, the balance between uh, if we find there's huge more margin increases during this period and maybe to avoid these well, to address the post cyclicality people you know we're talking about floors but if if a lot of these new margin requirements are caused by new market participants and, and retail people coming in in a period of incredible volatility then you're basically one consequence you'd be basically saying well everybody's got to pay up before so that when new people come in in a time of volatility, you know, not everybody doesn't have to, uh, the, the stress of the post cyclicality. So I, I think the, the, the composition of the market is also something that um, is, is uh, interesting, would be interesting to look at. And I was wondering if any of the panelists have any, or presenters have any um, perspective on that. Are, are we seeing or did we see a, a difference in composition of the market that new people coming in and therefore, that was uh, affecting um, the margin requirements too. I can take that. Um, this is Sunil from CME. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Catino. Hi, um, uh, Commissioner Berkowitz. I am afraid I can't tell you um, exactly the composition of the um, clients 
But there is one difference to keep in mind that um, we now have gross margining. We did not have that during the global financial crisis. So um, as you pointed out, um, if, you know, the two things can change, um, you know, if you're looking at aggregate margins, um, you know, it's the level of participation from existing participants if they are adding on to the open interest and the open interest captures that um, uh, at a higher level. Um, and then also addition of participants, uh, new participants entering the market. So from CME's perspective, we rely on our firms to actually enumerate the positions of each of the clients and we margin each of them individually. Then we take the gross of that amount and call our member firms. So uh, it's hard to answer that question uh, without actually looking back and uh, identifying the participants um, across that time period. Um, maybe I could add an interesting perspective, uh, please, Commissioner Berkowitz. It's Nick Westad again. Um, I, I tend to agree with Sunil. I don't think the underlying participants in the market and whether they are in or out or new people coming in or out should affect the level of initial margin which the CCP set for that particular margin. One of the reasons why we would ask that initial margin would be is set appropriately and covers a range of scenarios is to take into account um, new entrants and a variety of market participants. I think one one slightly more interesting subtopic from, from the topic you raise of retail participation is how is the retail participation happening? Which member firms are they accessing the market through? Um, and then what is the capital standards of those particular firms? Because I think the issues which we touch upon is we're obviously worried about systemic risk in the system. And I think we've heard a couple of times today and previously, and I referred to it in my remarks, that the, the, the bringer of risk of the system should backstop the risk in the system. But when these new participants are coming and they're coming through, you know, potentially weaker capitalized entities, then I think that's, you know, that is a cause of concern. Thank you, Mr. Restad. Uh, I recognize that we're running short of time. Ms. Hong, would you like to offer some final comments? Um, yes, thank you. Hi, it's Amy Hong from, from Goldman. Um, first, I, I'd like to thank the panelists for your thoughtful and thorough presentations. Um, the industry is so much more to learn from how the markets performed under pronounced stress in March, including the impact of post-crisis reforms. Um, we have the benefit of a significant amount of data as evidenced by the presentations today, which will guide a thoughtful and thorough look at what worked well, what didn't, and what may need to be recalibrated. As it relates to margin levels, uh, there is a tremendous amount of work and thought leadership already in the public domain from clearing members to CCPs, the buy side, and regulators. And, um, you know, I very much appreciate the, the efforts of the CFTC, including Commissioner Stump with the GMAC and Commissioner Benham with the MRAC to bring us together on one of the most challenging and important issues for the stability of the derivatives market. Uh, we, we, look, we look forward very much to continuing to collaborate with our clients, peers, and the CCPs and the CFTC to build upon the current framework. Um, very much, you know, in particular, I commend the FIA for their leadership in helping to drive an informed, data-driven discussion. Um, there are clearly more reflections to be had, not only about increasing margin levels, but also about appropriately calibrating inputs, like the margin period of risk on certain products, margin levels in times of low volatility, and whether floors should be instituted with appropriate and transparent look-back periods to, to ensure the resilience of the clearing ecosystem in both good times and in bad. So, um, you know, with that, I, I just like to reiterate, um, you know, very much uh, my appreciation for the opportunity to um, engage in this dialogue with all different perspectives um, around the clearing ecosystem. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Hong. 
Uh, Mr. Coutinho, I think you have a, a couple of comments uh, that respond to the presentations, and then I'll turn it back over to Andre. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the presenters as well um, for a very uh, informative presentation across the board. But I'd like to draw three things to the panel's attention. Um, first, um, you know, we try and uh, look at margins as a percentage of uh, notional in the contract, but there are serious problems with that approach. So um, I'll give you a, a very simple example. If you kept margin rates constant, and if the market dropped by 30%, margin as a percentage of notional would increase by 43%. So um, it is not a good comparison, and you wouldn't want margins as a percentage of notional to remain constant and fall, especially when risks are increasing. Uh, the second, um, you know, I, I don't think, um, you know, uh, it, 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 I, I think we need to actually be careful comparing the global financial crisis to the pandemic. Um, I'm heartened by the fact that many people recognize that, but a few things to note. One is um, volatility, if you look at 20-day volatility, increased 500% um, during the pandemic. It's not the case during the global financial crisis. So when comparing margin increases, um, and I think the presenters tried to do this, uh, it's important to compare uh, the margin increases to the environment we are in, uh, notwithstanding the, um, the the you know the the notwithstanding the side effect of greater costs for market participants to keep their risk exposures or take on more exposures. Um, the second thing about comparisons, um, you know, it's not the same environment. During the global financial crisis, we did not have gross margining. Uh, we have gross margining now. So the numbers are a little bit inflated. Um, and then um, with respect to retail participants, I think it's wrong to conclude that retail participants in and of themselves are risky. It's also wrong to conclude that um, because we have more retail participation, they would come in through weekly capitalized firms. I think, um, you know, and this is true with CME, we always look at clients and we look at firms. We look at firms and the clients that they support. We look at the capital that they have, capital wherewithal that they have, and we compare that to their clients, not only on a um, uh, on, on the, uh, at the rate of the exposure relative to the, uh, relative to the firm's capital, but we also compare their stress losses to the firm's capital. So I think there is no substitute for managing risk, but I would urge people not to walk away uh, with prejudices against either firms who are small or clients who are retail rather than institutional. And then finally, I would say that uh, I know there is a temptation, and I've seen this happen, to constrain CCPs or any counterparty from covering their risk exposures. We completely understand the concept of anti-procyclicality, and I, I believe we have demonstrated that. Um, the important thing is uh, to resist the temptation to place constraints, because not all crises are the same. And um, CCPs, as well as clearing firms, as well as non-clearing counterparties, need tools available to them to manage risk. If not, we are going to introduce more systemic risk. So with that, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coutinho. Uh, I would note that we're a couple of minutes over time. Uh, Commissioner Stump, this has clearly been a very robust um, forum, and we still have some additional comments, but I'm going to turn it over uh, to Andre to finish out uh, today's agenda. Thanks, Angie. Um, I'll just quickly turn it over to the commissioners for any closing remarks. I'll start with Commissioner Quintens. 
thank you, Andrea. Uh, uh, I don't have any uh, closing remarks other than to say that I thought this was one of the, if not the most uh, informative and data-driven and insightful advisory committee meetings uh, of which I've ever been a part um, and appreciate some of the different views around that data, uh, some of the hard questions that are being asked. Um, but I found it uh, wonderfully productive and informative and appreciate all the hard work uh, that was put into these presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Benham? Thanks, Andre. Um, I'll, I'll echo Commissioner Quintenza's statements. Really excellent discussion. And thanks to you, Andre, and, and Angie, and Commissioner Stump, and of course, <clears throat> all the panelists from um, stakeholders from the private sector, and of course, um, the CFTC staff were able to present a lot of great takeaways and look forward to continuing the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Berkovitz. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with uh, uh, both uh, Commissioner Benham and Commissioner Quintan's excellent presentations. Um, uh, uh, very data, very data driven, um, but, that, but that's what we need to make sound regulatory decisions, the best information available. Um, so, um, thank you for the presentations and, and uh, not only a, a, a data driven but diverse viewpoints. And, and I, I think we're, we're strengthened by, by having a variety of viewpoints and perspectives uh, on the significance of, of that data. So, uh, thank, thank you everybody uh, for, for all the presentations. And, and again, um, Andre, An An Angie, and Commissioner Stump uh, for your leadership in uh, in, in in setting up, up this uh, uh, presentation and meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Stump. Thank you, Andre, and thanks, Angie, for managing today's meeting. Uh, several months ago when we were discussing potential dates to hold this meeting, I had truly hoped that by scheduling today's meeting towards the end of the year that we might be in a position to convene in person. And while that's unfortunately not the case, and I'm very thankful that we can continue to advance the GMAX priorities in a format that ensures everyone's health and safety. I'm also very grateful to the GMAC members for continuing to engage with the committee this year, despite the challenging circumstances. And I think, as indicated by the fact that we've run out of time today, we have so much more to discuss in 2021, and I very much look forward to that. I'm hopeful that I will see all of you again in person in 2021. And as this is the last public meeting of the year, not only for the CFTC's five advisory committees, but also for our commission, I wanted to commend all of my regulatory colleagues around the world, as well as the market participants and infrastructure providers who have contributed to preserving sound and efficient markets during this very challenging year. I wish everyone happy holidays and may your new year be safe and healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Stump. Um, I also want to thank everyone for attending today's GMAC meeting, and I wish everyone a safe and healthy holiday season. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.